So it is 631. We're going to get started. Um, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. And so I, I would ask uh, everybody to uh, uh, find an end to their conversations. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So uh, first thing is to review and approve the agenda. I have uh, I think I am aware of two changes. Um, I hear that we may be postponing the ARPA discussion. That's correct, Madam Mayor. Okay, and the second thing is, um, so we had a, an item added to our agenda within the last uh, couple of days or so. Um, so it's item number 13 um, regarding PFAs in leachate um, as it relates to our wastewater or our water resource recovery facility. And so I think there's probably some folks here who are interested in that topic, am I right? Okay. So uh, we are going to move that item up uh, to appointment of city staff. Um, I think we should probably do that after the appointment. So it'll be item five and a half, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, OK. Uh, so I think that any other changes to the agenda? Okay, great. So that will consider, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And uh, if you would say your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be excellent. And that is true throughout the evening even if you have something um, relevant to say on a topic that is on our agenda. Um, but if it's not on our agenda, now is the time. So um, I'm not yet on the Zoom. So um, Cameron, I'm going to rely on you to see if there's any hands. Uh, but Stephen, go ahead. Uh, Steve Whitaker, um, I am raising a repeated issue about the website. Uh, there's been some controversy around three or multiple violations of open meeting law due to meeting warnings at the uh, infrastructure committee meeting at the parks commission and at the CVPSA. And I just went today, looked just moments ago, trying to get the packet to see what the later items backup material is. And the packet is not available on the meeting. And the assistant city manager says, go to the link on the homepage. I've done all of that, the packet. So there's functional deficiencies also with the calendar at the website. An event can show up in a list of upcoming meetings or not show up in a list of upcoming meetings, but yet show up on the committee page. So it's really a dysfunctional website, which is creating violations of law because pe people are not finding the warnings that they're supposed to be there. Um, so I want to raise that as a, as a problem. Uh, the other items relate to public safety authority. Uh, I think that's a separate agenda item, correct? The, I'm sorry, what, uh, is it related to the appointments to the public safety authority? Uh, yes, and the process of, of that. Okay. I yeah. think I, I didn't get a chance to raise these at the joint meeting with the Barry City Council. As long as it pertains to the appointments. Okay, well then I'll use my, the rest of my two That's minutes fine. on this. That's one. fine. The, the multiple failed warnings are being cavalierly dismissed as, oh, we'll, we'll just ratify it at another meeting. And we, we, in fact, I would say all of y'all were counting on Dan Richardson to do due diligence with regards to that appointment, and he was doing it. But now that he's not there, we've got uh, leadership which is running it off the rails. And not only do you need to fill Dan's, I would suggest you appoint somebody else uh, for the city appointment because you can't just violate the law and hold meetings that aren't warned at a restaurant and shift the date by a day and consider, and then figure you can unilaterally respond without, the law requires the board to take action to respond to a violation. The board has not even heard or been asked to take these up at the subsequent meetings. So you've got somewhat of an autocrat running it who happens to not be here tonight, and you need to rein that in because this city is uh, 
a key player in that organization. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Doug Hoyt, I see you've got your hand raised. Oh, no, I think you momentarily unmuted yourself, but you are still muted. Double click, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, I just wanted to encourage you to turn the volume up. I've got my volume up all the way, and unfortunately I could not hear probably about 20% of what Mr. Whitaker had to say. Okay. So I think we're working on that, yes? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for um, letting us know that. And if it doesn't get better, please um, I'll know, raise, raise my your hand, hand again. I'll raise my hand again. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> all right. Uh, all right, so I think we are. Oh, anyone else um, in person uh, like to make a, com a comment on something not on our agenda? Uh, okay. Um, and just checking. Is there anyone else online who would like to make a comment? You could unmute yourself. You could um, use the raise hand icon. You could just wave. But I am not seeing anyone. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to move on then. So on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, I'll, oh, yes, Jack. I had some conversation with the with the clerk, and there are some changes being made to the to the minutes, but they were just uh, typos. Okay. So I was flailing to do these other things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, nothing substantive then. Okay. Great. Uh, all right. So uh, there's thank you for that, letting us know. Um, all right. So there's been a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so on to the appointment of city staff to the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority core team. Uh, and for this, I, um, I, I'm either looking at you, Bill, or perhaps at uh, Doug. Um, uh, yeah, yes. I, think, I think you should hear from the CVPSA folks first, and then we have um, some comments oh, about that. Okay. Uh, CVPSA folks here. Chief Hoyt is here and oh, Chief Hoyt, yes. um, Paco Almond is here. Okay, great. Well, I will turn it over to uh, to you, uh, Doug and Paco. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll try to be very brief here. Uh, I think most of us are pretty much in agreement that the best way that we can approach the uh, continuing efforts of the Public Safety Authority uh, in conjunction with activities regarding communications in the public safety area in central Vermont is that we continue the work that was set up and uh, established with Televate and our report, which you have uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity to receive. Um, there's a lot there. I'm sure it's going to take you a couple of minutes to digest it all. And I would not be surprised if you have a few more questions that need to be answered. Um, but we believe that the best way to move forward is to have a, a core group of individuals that can guide and manage the uh, future efforts as it relates to the establishment of priorities. Uh, uh, developing uh, a funding mechanism, uh, enhancing a governance model, and, and move forward. Uh, briefly, uh, the Televate plan, which the Public Safety Authority has uh, received uh, and, and, and endorsed, um, has uh, three major uh, projects or phases, if you will, and Obviously, number one has to be done before two and three. The report is not uh, all encompassing. We don't expect, uh, I don't think anyone expects that all of this is gonna be done uh, in, in one, one full swoop. Uh, 
but having um, staff that are intimately involved in the communications efforts in, in this process, we believe would uh, make the process a whole lot easier. So that's what we're, we're asking the, the council for. And um, it's my, my task to also move forward and, and talk with uh, uh, Barry and ask them to do the same. And um, we're also involved heavily with working with uh, members of Capital Fire Mutual Aid. So I guess I'll turn it over to Paco if he wants to add anything, if you don't mind. And if you have any questions, um, I'll try to answer them. And if I can't, I know Paco can. Great. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, as, as everybody knows from looking at the report, this is a, uh, a big project that's going to require a lot of planning. Uh, and that's where uh, the group, the two cities, the members of CVPSA is right now is trying to bring together relevant stakeholders that can help in the planning process. Those relevant stakeholders uh, are key staff in each of the two cities in Capital Fire. It is the public safety personnel that are going to be using the equipment at the end of the day. And so we're just basically looking to, to the city councils to appoint uh, some of their key staff to um, a planning committee that's going to get together. We are calling it the core, core team to help uh, guide this project forward. Great. Uh, any questions for uh, either uh, Doug or for Paco? Okay. Um, do you have something to say? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is this request has not been made or discussed by the CVPSA board. In fact, the Televate report uh, does mention this as one possible path forward, but this is an example of the way that the CVPSA is being managed. The CVPSA you've heard for several years, the Public Safety Authority has requested that the cities, the members, appoint a chief or administrator levels uh, appointees to this body. Uh, that in effect would keep the process above board, managed in transparent and recorded public meetings, et cetera. And instead what happened is we got this Televate report and the city managers and chiefs went behind closed doors to come up with their recommendation and put their own spin on it. You understand or all council members should understand that this uh the city has a conflict of interest here and in that they're relying on the three or four hundred thousand dollars that they collect for a dispatch facility which is running at cross purposes to what regional dispatch will necessitate regional dispatch will necess necessitate inviting other served towns that we dispatch for into the organization and that cannot be done uh in a uh third rail process. So the fact that this request has not been made or discussed by a vote, I've been through the minutes of CVPSA, and they have not discussed or requested this. So this is part of the problem I'm trying to raise with you is that you you have a, a derailed off the rails system where uh, accountability and transparency are suffering. And the only way CVPSA is going to get on the right track is through appointments that to people who will show up to regular meetings that are recorded and that are minutes created. Uh, but this process of creating committees and ambiguity about what's open meetings and who's meeting privately with who is not the way to go about it. Uh, Thank you. Right. Uh, so I, I'm interested in, well, actually, unless there's any further questions from council or thoughts or comments. Um, I am curious for, for your thoughts uh, on this topic, Bill. Sure. Well, um, so I think in general, with regard to managing a large project, uh, it makes a lot of sense to have the key people from both cities involved. Um, Excuse me? Excuse me? Sorry. Is that me? I can't hear anybody. Okay. Is that better? 
Any? No? I'm, I'm, my, my mouth's on the mic. Is that? Okay, I'm fine, I'm told. People over here don't think I'm fine. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so in general, we think that having key staff involved uh, in making decisions on technical projects like this is, is essential, and we don't necessarily disagree with what's been suggested here um, uh, to the extent that uh, Mr. Whitaker pointed out that the board hadn't discussed this. This hadn't really been discussed with us either in advance of this. I mean, in general, there have been, has been talk, as, as was just referenced, that um, it would be good to have people um, like the, the chiefs and the managers on the board, and, and we've heard that and we understand that. Um, so I, I would say it might make sense for us to just uh, table this till the next meeting so we can have a chance to talk amongst ourselves and um, to talk with our counterparts in Barry and maybe understand what a little bit more of what's being asked of us. I think we understand, but give CVPSA full board a chance to, to really deliberate this. So um, we're not trying in any way to stop this or say that we disagree with it, but we, we're, we're, I guess we're just not quite ready to say we're, we're in because we don't know what we're in for yet. So. I think that makes sense. And uh, one of the things that was, so, so for all of the reasons that you said that, I think that makes sense. But uh, also in addition, I mean, I was even just curious to hear from those folks whether or not they were willing you know, to do to do that um so if if it uh means that um unless there's a, a um, an urgency to um, make that these appointments tonight i think it would be wise to to mm -hmm. put this off um and i just uh just checking in doug and paco i um my understanding is that that would probably be okay if we if we made these appointments at the next. Oh yeah, go ahead, Bill. Uh, oops, I'm going to unmute myself. Oh, I can't unmute myself. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, don't unmute yourself. I, but I'm muted. That's I, good. But I want to talk. No, but oh, oh, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Head, head, heads, of, heads in a lot of different places here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I think the biggest issue from my perspective, and I don't know uh, what Doug and Paco would say, is that to the extent that we want to budget for funds, that we decide it's a viable project, we want to get money in these mm -hmm. budgets, we'd probably want to make sure that Barry, you know, that we were working on the same track with Barry. Um, so that would be the urgency, but I'm not sure that, you know, we can still have those conversations whether we're officially appointed to anything or not. And um, I don't think there's anything that prevents us from waiting till November 10. Okay. Well, it's, uh, unless there's strong objection, I think that's probably what we should go with. Is that all right here, team? So I don't think we need a, a motion to, to table officially. We can just put this on another uh, future agenda. Is that agreeable? Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, everybody. And we are going to move on then to our discussion of um, of leachate um, regarding particularly regarding the the PFAs uh, that the uh, the leachate contains. Uh, so for uh, so I'll just start by saying uh, uh, as someone who appreciates science, the PFAs are deeply concerning, and uh, they. Uh, they should i just want to start even really by saying that no one really should be making pfas uh it's it's awful that they exist uh first of all um so i think the question here is so they, they do exist they're in the leachate um what happens to them and where uh where do they go um and so we have this opportunity as um there are uh, the Agency of Natural Resources is accepting uh, comments uh, currently regarding uh, PFAs that uh, now is an, an opportune time to, to talk about this. Anyway, so I want to, um, beyond that, uh, I would like to have an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, have a chance to uh, share their thoughts about leachate or PFAs. 
uh, with the council and from there have a, well, actually if, if, I don't know if any staff have anything that they want to say, um, but other, otherwise after the public comment, we'll go to a council discussion in light of public comment. Uh, all right, so from there, I'm going to start with folks in person. Um, anyone who is present wish to make a comment and don't forget to say your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments to two minutes if you can. Sure. If you've got more than that, then you can. Okay. okay. Get close right. to the mic. Um, yeah, we'll get closer. Get to the mic. Yeah. Sorry, I've never That's done okay. this before. Um, um, my even name closer. Is even closer. closer. Yes. Oh my yes. gosh. Tilt it down. Is that better? Yeah. Is that That's good? good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, good evening. My name is Christy Binzen. I live over on Franklin Street in Montpelier, and I've lived there for um, almost three years now. Prior to living there, I lived in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is relevant because of the conversation about PFAS. So that section of North Carolina is a watershed that has been seriously polluted by PFAS that have been discharged upriver, and the end result of that is a very serious situation for the whole watershed, for fish life, and for people living in the area for whom that is the water supply. Um, I'm here tonight because when I learned that PFAS were being discharged into the river here through our city, I was very, very concerned. I can say that I just urge the council to reject the proposal that ANR is making to take an increased amount of leachate I think that now is the time to act on the side of prevention. You know, there's an old saying about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Unfortunately, with PFAS, there is no cure right now. So I think prevention is the way to go. Um, the agency, the uh, EPA right now is making a priority of looking into PFAS and how to really react to all the PFAS that's in our environment. And one of their key components is prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. So I think that we as a city have an opportunity right now to um, take action to prevent the further discharge of PFAS into our water system, which obviously is critical for all of us and our children and the future of our community. So thank you very much for the time tonight. I appreciate thank it. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry to belabor my uh, presence here tonight. The okay. PFOA and PFAS uh, has been something that I've paid attention to for some years now, and I'm in touch with folks who have had surgery, organs removed. Uh, the engineer who uh, worked on the design for the uh, sintering towers down in Bennington County where the sheets of Teflon were raised and all the airing debris blown out across the landscape. In, in short, we don't have the right to to put this into the river uh, for those in Middlesex and and Richmond and, and Burlington to swim in. Uh, this is a, a question of morality. And I know we have economics that we get revenue from using our sewer treatment plant to process leachate from Coventry. But this this is where we should take take a stand and do the moral the moral right thing. Uh, you know, David is having to deal with issues of having his blood removed and filtered. It, it is not easy to get this stuff out of your body. And we all have it. It's everyone in almost everyone who's ever been tested has shown that they've accumulated some of this Teflon residue. Maybe that's a misnomer to, to Teflon's a subset of this. But my point is, this is not something to play with. And we certainly not stuff to take liberties with other people's lively, life and livelihood with. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for letting us speak to this important point. Obviously, we all know PFAS are a scary toxin that are, is the, and it is associated with any number of serious health concerns. And I just want to make the point that I and others are not saying not in my backyard. We're saying not in anyone's backyard. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, city council has the status to go to the Agency of Natural Resources and say, you all, the state needs to take care of this. And if it's you know, building holding tanks, there are things to be done. 
in order to keep this leachate from going into the water. And the Agency of Natural Resources, in my opinion, needs to step up and pay attention to that. And one of the ways they will is when folks like you and other municipalities say, this is not a hot potato for us to toss around among us. It's your mess. So thank you for letting me speak. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, what was your name? Can we get your name? Where are you from? Sorry, I forgot about that. Got excited. Daryl Bloom, uh, Montpelier. Uh, I live on Summer Street. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Thank you, and I know you've all been putting up with hearing a lot from me on this subject of late. Um, thanks for making it a serious priority. I appreciate it. I just want to say that I don't think toxic waste disposal is a Montpelier problem. It's a state of Vermont problem. As, and a big part of that problem is that the state of Vermont and the Agency of Natural Resources doesn't have a plan for how to take care of our solid waste. Instead, they've given over a great deal of authority to a for-profit company that makes money on that solid waste. Now that the public is finding out more and more about the environmental dangers and serious health risks about PFAS, discharging them into our waterways is not an option, unless there was a safe and effective treatment that removes them safely from the waste stream. The ANR permit sets up a pilot project, but there is no safe technology determined yet for taking them out of the waste stream. And since there isn't, we have to do something like what Daryl just mentioned, which is some find some way to sequester them out of anybody's watershed until such time as we do have, store it safely until we do have a treatment. Allowing the company that makes millions and millions of dollars off our <laughs> solid waste to make the decisions about how to manage it is the wrong way around this. And the permit clearly gives a lot of authority to Casella to make decisions that I think the state should be making. It is the state's responsibility to protect the public health and our natural environment. It's not Casella's responsibility. ANR's draft discharge permit, I hope you will table and reject until the agency develops standards and regulations for the disposal of leachate. Montpelier shouldn't be responsible for absorbing the toxic waste coming from not only Vermont, but other states as well. This is the state's responsibility. And the sooner we join Newport and Essex and stop taking the leachate, the sooner the state will begin to take on that responsibility. So we ask the council tonight to begin to make a plan to stop taking leachate and to put public safety and the protection of our natural resources above any of the economic considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kathy Squires, Montpelier. Um, I'm also really concerned about this leachate um as well i'm sure everyone is so um my concern is how are we going to separate the leachates out of our sewage um given there's no way to do that at this time not a good quality time or not quality and the other thing is um taking it on from other people so it just seems like we are just harming our rivers and our waterways so that's my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, John, did you get her name? Okay. Welcome. Hi. I'm Elisa Dworsky. I live at 31 First Avenue in Montpelier. And I'm frankly new to being aware of this issue. I didn't realize until this week that Montpelier was already processing this leachate and releasing these toxins into the Dog River because it couldn't be processed appropriately by our wastewater treatment system. And I guess in that sense, I may re represent the point of view that maybe not that many people in our community or maybe people are starting to realize this is an important issue. And I think that's a strong reason to uh, not, not accept further, further leachate into the wastewater system. We need time as a community to understand this issue. And I very much support the fact that I think you're in a position where by rejecting, taking further uh, leachate, you can send this message to the state and put pressure for other solutions to be arrived at. And I think the storage 
concept that other people have articulated makes a lot of sense, but to act quickly and to move forward with the status quo clearly doesn't make any sense because the risks are so high. So thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else in person? Okay, I'm going to uh, turn to folks uh, online. Anyone who's with us digitally wish to make a comment? Okay, Shana, I see your hand. Go ahead. Hi, all. My name is Shana Casper. I work with a group called Community Action Works, formerly Toxics Action Center, and I work with community groups fighting pollution threats in their neighborhoods. And for the past five years, I've co-facilitated the National PFAS Contamination Coalition, which is a network of 40 community groups fighting PFAS contamination in their communities. And I am so grateful to not have to be a part of this team. This is a group of volunteers, of folks who have had cancers, have had kids with cancers, have had trouble having kids. I'm really seeing the impact that PFAS in people's drinking water in particular and in their occupational exposures has had on people's health. And full disclosure too, I just wanna say that we are also in pending litigation with Casella over Clean Water Act violations in Bethlehem, New Hampshire and the Amanusik River contamination. I really don't want this stuff to be contaminating my community and, and downriver of Winooski. Um, because I'm also, you know, I'm a Montpelier resident. I live on Kent Street. I care really deeply about this community and serve on several city committees. I don't want to take significantly more PFAS into our wastewater treatment facility. And that's why myself and as of right now, 37 other people are calling on the Montpelier City Council to First of all, write a letter to Agency of Natural Resources calling on them to deny this permit for taking increased leachate and to commit to not taking leachate through our wastewater treatment facility. Um, no matter where the, the um, permit uh, ends up, uh, the city can make a commitment to not take any more leachate from, um, into our wastewater treatment facility. And as Daryl said, finding a solution is not just closing our doors to taking this leachate. We don't wanna take this here. And we also want to go upstream and turn off the tap of contamination. You know, We need to make sure that this garbage juice isn't just not going to Montpelier, but that it's not going anywhere. And so I think you know, connecting with other uh, city councils in Concord, New Hampshire and Plattsburgh, New York to collectively commit to not taking landfill leachate until it is treated and PFAS free is an important next step. Um, so that's kind of the things that I want to propose um, today. And um, yeah, really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. And I see your hand. Uh, Deborah, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah Dwyer. I live on Course Street in Montpelier. And I too just recently became aware of this issue. And it's pretty shocking to me that we are dumping this stuff into the river and letting it go downstream to, you know, to our neighbors. So I urge the council to reject the proposal to take an increased amount of it and to instead make a plan to stop taking it all together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Burns, go ahead and then we'll go uh, Renee Ansel. Uh, thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity to um, speak tonight. Um, I am Paul Burns. I live at 18 Isabel Circle in Montpelier. Um, lived here since 2004. Um, I also uh, am the director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPIRG. VPIRG has played a role in um, advocating for solutions to hazardous and toxic waste problems uh, for many years. And just earlier this year, uh, we're one of the leaders in helping to pass legislation to address the presence of PFAS in commonly used consumer products, some of which get thrown away after their useful life has ended and end up in the landfill and thus contributing to this leachate problem. So I agree with other speakers. I wanna echo and appreciate so much of what has been said already that the best solution is to stop making and using uh, this, this family of chemicals, which is some 9,000 chemicals uh, uh, in total in this uh, in the PFAS uh, uh, family. So I recognize there is no easy answer uh, to this, but I also know that uh, Casella has a 
uh, at best a spotty track record when it comes to environmental protection. Uh, PFAS is a very, very difficult issue. Um, sometimes by forcing the issue, by saying no to this proposal, which is uh, significantly flawed, I think, it helps to drive uh, better answers and better solutions. So again, I appreciate the comments that have been made so far. Uh, we support uh, a rejection of this uh, proposal. Uh, no to any leachate uh, in Montpelier that contains PFAS. We support a treatment system for this that can help to address some of the problems. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Uh, Renee. Hi, I'm a resident of Montpelier too. I live in Kent Street and um, I echo the same way what has been said by other citizens. And um, I just want to add that so far people have gone through this pandemic Lots of people have decided to get vaccinated. And according to the Environmental Working Group, PFAS um, stopped the effectiveness, effectiveness of vaccination. So it's another concern for the community. And also I wanna add up that there is no money in the world to put toxic waste into our water system and poison our community. I agree that there has to be more studies and other ways that we need to um, address the use of these chemicals and people need to be more conscious about what they buy. But at the moment, making a decision to um, to add more gallons of this poison into our water, um, is there's no money figure to that. And I, I uh, encourage you guys to say no and send a letter to ANR saying now we won't take it as other communities have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, with us digitally wish to make a comment? You can just wave your hand or just unmute yourself. Go ahead, Peter. Um, I, I would just like to add one thing that I haven't heard yet. Um, a number of people have said that they were unaware of this. I'll add my name to that as well. And I'll bet that 95% of the people in Montpelier we're unaware of this and are probably unaware of the products that they buy and throw away that contain PVAS. And it seems to me that that is a step that some the city agency in conjunction with um, perhaps the Central Vermont Waste Management District could be proactive about. Uh, name the names of products that contain them and uh, urge people not to throw those away into the dumpster at Casella's or anywhere else. Thanks. Peter Kelman, sorry. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess I'll open back uh, up. Uh, anyone in, uh, in person or digitally wish to make a further comment? Okay. All right, uh, well, thank you. Um, and so, uh, this was uh, uh, brought to us actually by Councillor Hurl. Um, do you want to uh, jump in at this point? Sure, I can kind of give a little overview of what I've been kind of hearing from community members and thinking about this topic and have some thoughts on maybe where we go from here um, for Council to consider. Um, you know, like I imagine all of you, I've been hearing from a lot of constituents and as we're seeing tonight, you know, a lot of concern about, you know, our practice of importing PFAS containing leachate, which our water resource recovery facility is not equipped to filter as no such facilities anywhere are set up to do, um, certainly in Vermont. So we know it's going right into our rivers and you know, someone might have mentioned it, but you know, these again are called forever chemicals because they're incredibly persistent. So we know as they're going into our water, they are staying in our environment um, forever. 
Uh, they're mobile, so they move around. They're shown places where you're putting it into the environment. It's getting into groundwater. That's why you're seeing all over the country, you know, these huge issues with people's drinking water being contaminated. Um, you know, and we've heard tonight of the many places that these chemicals are used. You know, nonstick pans, Gore-Tex waterproof gear, stain-resistant sprays, um, and we're throwing those products away. And then the leachate, there's the chemicals are getting into the leachate and coming here. Um, and so, you know, again, we've seen these, this contamination of, you know, really devastating impacts in communities all over the country. I was just talking to a friend in Bennington last night, where of course was the first discovery of PFAS contamination of drinking water in the state. And I was asking about connecting with um, a person who I've worked with a few times who had really high levels of PFAS in his blood. And he told me that in fact, um, he had died this summer of cancer. And I was just like devastating to hear. I mean, it just reminded me of, you know, the serious health threats that exposure to these chemicals cause. Um, you know, we heard about the uh, action the legislature is taking to ban these chemicals from all kinds of products. This is a great step. We need to keep on that track. And in the meantime, we have, you know, decades worth of PFAS that we're going to continue having to deal with um, for generations to come. Um, last week, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency put out a roadmap, and it clearly showed that they are uh, acknowledging the urgency and scope of the crisis. It's the EPA, so it's slow moving and will be <laughs> years of work to really get things going. Um, but it, you know, it definitely signaled that, you know, wastewater treatment facilities are going to be regulated. Like this is the track we're going on. So us being proactive and getting ahead of it, I think makes all the sense in the world for all the reasons we've heard tonight. Um, and to be clear, I don't blame our facility for this problem. And in this situation, I don't blame Casella. This is, I blame, you know, not all of us who unknowingly use these products with these chemicals. I blame the chemical industry who knew for decades that these chemicals were toxic and persistent, who hid it, who lied about it, and continued to manufacture them and continue to this day to manufacture them and reap billions upon billions of dollars in profits um, as they poison us. So that's who, as we look down the line to who we're holding accountable for costs of uh, prevention and cleanup, that's where I think we should all be looking. But in the meantime, we need to figure out how, you know, where we go from here. Um, you know, I really have struggled with this because, you know, on the one hand, we could just say, let's stop today taking it, but this is a regional problem. And I don't really love the idea of us just saying no, not doing anything to help push to address the issue upstream and this just going to another community. Um, often, you know, we've seen time and again where, you know, environmental justice issues, where it goes to low-income communities, communities of color, and, you know, us to make a decision that just results in that without getting at any, um, you know, bigger, longer-term solutions concerns me. So I'm really wrestling with that. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about some principles that maybe council could consider um, adopting and, you know, maybe we could shape it into a letter from the city. Um, so the, the kind of high level I was thinking of and um, interested in people's thoughts on this. So number one, Montpelier is committed to developing a plan to eliminate intake of PFAS contaminated leachate and associated releases into our waters. In the short term, Montpelier expects ANR Agency of Natural Resources and Casella to move forward with treating leachate as quickly and effectively using best available technology as possible. ANR must have a much stronger oversight role of this process with public health and environmental protection front and center, and that oversight must extend to determining the pretreatment technology, testing, monitoring, and timeline to ensure it is successful. And the state and or Casella should provide much more robust monitoring of the current and any future impacts of PFAS releases into Montpelier's water, soil, and fish and wildlife. So that's, those were the, what I'm thinking. I mean, that clearly we need, you know, more discussion, more, I think, understanding of implications of, you know, turning off the tap of bringing PFAS contaminated leachate 
into the city, but I think putting that commitment forward to coming up with that plan and then, you know, as Castell as ANR is moving forward with a permit, um, expressing these kind of concerns with the current construct of it and pushing for a more um, a quick and more effective approach than what it be could happen under the current um, scenario. Um, just like two other thoughts. One, I think it's worth also potentially looking at um, federal or state funding opportunities for uh, improved filtration at our own water resource recovery facility. So not taking on the Casella pilot project around leachate pretreatment, but I know that there have been discussions federally around increased resources for dealing with contamination because this has been such a huge issue all over the country. So there might be some resources we could get to um, improve filtration. There was an ANR study looking at the facilities all over the state and ours was either the highest or one of the highest because of the leachate we take in for PFAS levels in the effluent, but every single one had PFAS uh, coming out because of you know, all of us washing our clothes that contain PFAS and other things. So I think you know, either way, it's not gonna be an ongoing problem. So I think looking at better filtration um, and I think the city, when we look at our legislative agenda should support efforts to hold toxic polluters accountable for the harm they cause. Great, thank you. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I'm gonna see if other folks have thoughts first. Go ahead, Connor. I, I, I'm just wondering if it makes sense for maybe Kurt or Bill to go through the memo that was um, released there, because I think I could shed some light and I probably have some follow-up questions on that. Sure. Yeah, um... Sure, we could. It'd probably be easiest if Kurt, who is our most technical expert on this, uh, if he cares to, I think he's on the call. Are you you in? Yeah, I'm here. here. Oh. Um, I love the whole thing. I don't have that right in front of me. Garth. <laughs> can you try talking now, Kurt? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Hear me? Well, we can hear you, <laughs> but it sounds a little bit like Darth Vader. Oh yeah, no, that's not going to work. But, uh, he's going to call in. Okay. Translating. <laughs> uh, okay, well maybe um, we can wait for Kurt to call in. Anything you also want to you, you want to add? Know, I, before? I mean, I think everyone's really summed it up that we the city certainly has the same concerns that every, everybody has as as far as this goes, and we've been taking leachate for many many years. And uh, we're not interested in increasing the amount that we take. We do understand that we all societally contribute to putting stuff in and using these products. And we all societally have chosen to have landfill as our waste disposal. And so that produces leachate. We contribute to the landfill as well with our own you know, waste sludge. Uh, so it's a complicated situation. It certainly is a, a big financial issue for the city, but I also understand the perspective that you know people's lives and health and safety is takes priority over that. Um, and it's you know we don't know how to how to solve the problem. I think we fully agree that you know stopping it at the source is the best way. Banning it completely would be you know even but even banning it and stopping it banning it for the future. This stuff's in the landfill and will be for a long time. So the question is, how do you treat what's what's there before we get it or when we get it? Um, because it's not it's not a great situation. I think our, our concern is, as Councilmember Hurl says, is right now it's it's in the leachate, it's being produced, and it's got to go somewhere. So um, you know, not, if it's not here, then where and who's going to take it and what's going to be done with it? Because it's got to be disposed of. So I, I don't know the answer to that. And I think the state should be, um, this should be at the head of their class in terms of stuff they're working on. Well, unless, oh, maybe Kurt, have you joined the Zoom on your phone at this point? I think you might have. Uh, yep, I'm here now. Oh, we can hear you very well. Go ahead. Okay. 
so yes, we uh, also heard from a lot of residents, uh, myself and Chris Cox, who's the chief operator at our wastewater plant. And so we um, put together a memo just sort of giving some background on uh, this issue. Um, I'll just kind of run through the highlights of that. Uh, so first is the, um, just to kind of start out, this is um, an emerging chemical, uh, emerging issue. Um, there's not a lot of, well, the one, there's not a, a proven uh, technology to treat PFAS. Um, the, currently the only um, mechanism for um, treating PFAS is at wastewater plants. Wastewater plants were, were not designed to remove PFAS. Um, it, we can treat the leachate very well. We can remove the metals, um, the BOD, um, all you know, pretty much all the other contaminants. But we we were never um, anticipated having to remove PFAS. So um, that's just kind of a, a one point I wanted to make on to start off. Um, the other thing is the testing methods for PFAS um, and wastewater. So historically, they've been using drinking water standards. Um, just recently, uh, just last month, EPA has, uh, EPA has announced, um, you know, some guidance on uh, surface water uh, treatment techniques. So we actually don't have any data, um, any sample data um, that actually, you know, follows a true um, procedure for um, surface water discharge, which is the effluent from the wastewater plant. Um, and then, you know, as was discussed a little bit um, earlier, that the um, the permit for Casella um, it does uh, it does require some uh, pilot testing of treatment um, on you know a point source treatment. Um, but you know, I think the the options right now are uh, incineration, which you know there's concerns about you know, what's going to happen, um, you know, for air quality. Uh, uh, using that. Another method is, is potentially um, capturing the PFAS in carbon, um, which again, uh, you, you're left with a concentrated volume of PFAS that uh, then has to be dealt with, likely back to the landfill. Um, and then the other one that they're looking at is, is deep groundwater injection. But, um, you know, none of those are really uh, great options at this point, but, um, you know, the, the technology to PFAS is, is really in development. Uh, there's not a great option at the moment. Um, and then also, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about increasing the amount that Montpelier um, will take under this permit. Really, uh, the permit, and it, it does increase, uh, it does state an increase in the gallons um, that can be um, brought to Montpelier. But really, the limit the, under the existing permit is through uh, the biological oxygen demand, which is kind of the strength of the of the leachate, call it BOD. Um, and that is actually there's a, a a new condition of the permit to limit um, the uh, maximum amount of BOD um, that can be brought to Montpelier daily. So when you factor that in, um, it actually puts a more restrictive cap on the total gallons because although there was a, a limit of 24,000 gallons in the existing permit, um, they, uh, that could, that gallon could be exceeded provided the BOD didn't exceed um, 1,200 uh, pounds per day. So, um, so it's actually more restrictive. But also, uh, you know, we keep a close eye on, um, on the leachate that we take in and you know, if there's any issues with treatment, uh, our operators can restrict that volume. So, uh, and, and historically, that's been what has been limiting um, the amount of leachate that we take, not so much the uh, gallons in the old permit. So, we don't anticipate taking, you know, uh, you know, doubling our leachate intake. Uh, it's really going to be, you know, very pretty much the same as it as it had has been under the old permit. So, I just wanted to, um, you know, clarify that point. I mean, and then the other thing, you know, that was in the memo is, is the financials. Um, you know, we do take in a, a fair amount of revenue from leachate and we're using, you know, that money goes to the sewer fund to help fund uh, improvement projects. And, you know, one of the main um, goals of city staff right now, myself and um, 
and the rest of public works uh, supported through you know the manager's office is CSO reduction. So you know that's another um, environmental impact that we have through our um, combined wet weather overflows. Um, and so you know if we do um, you know halt receiving leachate, then that's uh, you know less investment we can put into um, cleaning up, you know, the, the discharges from combined sewer overflows. It's, it's, that's a very expensive, another very expensive issue that uh, the city's faced with. So that's kind of the high level overview. Take any questions if, um, if there are any. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, sure, Kurt. Uh, are we the only municipality accepting this now in Vermont? In Vermont, yes, under the permit. Um, that's correct. Likely if the city were to stop taking leachate. Um, what we heard from Casella is that majority would go to Plattsburgh, um, which would, you know, um, discharge into Lake Champlain, which is the eventual uh, water source um, that our discharge goes to. And Kurt, could you talk about, um, a lot of folks commented, maybe an option would be like storing this until the technology catches up and we can think of a way to treat it. Uh, is that just impractical because it's tens of millions of gallons of this or it is i think last year we um, i'm gonna have to look it up but you know it is millions of gallons um, that we take a year so i don't know that that's really feasible to construct you know, storage tanks of that size you know that could really you know um, store the volume that's being produced uh, for that sort of duration thanks very much kurt other thoughts from council? Well, I, I'll jump in here and say that uh, th so, so what you're proposing, Lauren, that we write a letter with these guiding principles, uh, I, I think is um, at the very least a good plan. Um, uh, I <laughs> my gut is that i just want to be done with it like i let's just cancel it let's just not take any more leachate and that's okay. in a sense like the easy the easy decision to make um even though we know that that would not eliminate the amount of pfas that would be in the effluent because every wastewater treatment facility in vermont had pfas uh, coming out of it regardless of whether or not they took leachate Having said that, uh, the question that I find myself wrestling with is, is it better to just cancel and be done and walk away and say, you know, ship it to Plattsburgh? Or is it better to try to keep tension on a and r somehow? And it seems to me that we could potentially, and i'm I'm open to being wrong about this, <laughs> I open to discussion, but one potential path forward would be to say, uh, you need you need some kind of pretreatment solution. You need to do something. Uh, maybe there's not perfect technology, but there there may be options. Uh, and so, uh, if if there's not uh, I, I'm, I'm making this up right now, and we could we could wordsmith this. But um, one possibility is that we could say uh, we would like to no longer have PFAS in our leachate, or not be taking leachate at all uh, in two years. Right? Like you have two years to like get this together. Uh, if in two years you uh, there is still PFAS in the leachate, then we're out. Um, and in a way that might keep uh, the tension on A&R, keep tension on Casella to keep making progress so that it can not end up in anyone's backyard, right? Because we don't, we don't want it going to Plattsburgh either, right? Um, we don't want it to be, to be going anywhere. And really, if we, if we just say we're out, uh, you know, does that, does that put as much pressure on uh, the progress? And I, I will confess, I, I don't, I don't really know. I, it seems to me that um, having a 
uh, writing a letter saying these are our principles and we would uh, here's what we want to see from uh, from you Casella or from you ANR uh, and giving them a, a sort of a deadline um, that's that's one option I just want to put that out there go ahead Jack um, is it's two years I know you just threw out two years it could be five years it could be whatever but is there does the technology exist or is there even a time frame when we could think the technology will exist to 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 effectively treat it to get it out go ahead lauren so my understanding and there might be people in the room who know or on zoom who know more um so essentially what this permit is giving is casella two years to decide on a pretreatment technology. They already did a feasible feasibility study of a couple options that's already been done. I mean, it is emerging technology and, you know, no state has done a better job than Vermont yet and stuff, you know, we're not, um, but, but there are technologies that do exist. So there's the filtering it out and then you have to deal with the residuals because, you know, if you capture it, then you've got you know, concentrated PFAS that do you just throw it back in the landfill and it gets back in the leachate or is there, do you treat it as, you know, hazardous waste or again, incineration as Kurt mentioned is, is an option, but then it just puts it up into the air into a community. So there's, they're still wrestling with some of it, but Casella did identify some potential technologies. And so what they're being asked to do on the next two year timeline is um, decide on one, come up with a plan, build one within the next year, and then basically have a year, if I'm remembering right, to kind of do the testing and monitoring and see if it's working. So that's what this you know, permit right now that's out for comment is essentially approving that kind of timeline and, and plan for test, doing a pilot test of one of these technologies to see if it is effective. Um, so, you know, I do think putting some pressure on you know, on some end to keep them on track and making sure that they're going to choose a good technology. And I think, you know, this should be A&R's responsibility and not deferred to, they defer extensively to Casella to just figure this all out. And, you know, their, their motives are, their mission is not the same as A&R's, which is to protect public health and the environment. So um, that's a concern, which is where I think Montpelier pushing on more oversight, more um, more of the agency taking this on as a state responsibility than punting it to Gazella is an important consideration to me. Other thoughts? Yeah, oh, go, uh, go ahead, Connor, and then Jay. Yeah, so just, just wanted to start off uh, thanking Lauren for bringing this up here and really pushing the issue. I think it's incredibly important. And, and the other point to make, you know, if we're the only municipality taking this in the state, this isn't a Montpelier issue. This is a regional issue right here. And I, I, I think what that means is we need to redefine our relationship with a &R as we go forward here. You know, I don't want to be going hat in hand and asking, ah, could you do more than four tests a year on the water here? We're your partners, you know, and we do have we do have the trump card that we don't have to continue taking this. But that's a very good point. Do we want to just, you're either at the table or on the menu. Do we want to punt this off to Plattsburgh and see what they do with it? I, I think there is... There is some logic in using this to push A&R in the right direction, push Casella in the right direction, and I'm not sure the actual timeline, um, but you know, I, I, I think we can make an impact on policy here. I'm really glad I, I see Representative Hooper and Senator Cummings are in the meeting here, and I know they've been following this issue closely, so it's good to have them on the team. Uh, but I, you know, I, I definitely like to get A&R staff in here, um, ASAP, I think they're are they scheduled for November sometime to come in? I, th I think it's time to bring them in here and just have a really frank discussion about how we move forward on this. But uh, in, in the meantime, the principles that Lauren's laid out, I, I'm really comfortable with. And again, wouldn't be, wouldn't be beyond saying no thanks at some point if it feels like we aren't considered a, a partner in this and uh, just submitting comments before deadlines and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think regular meetings uh, with the agency. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks, Connor. I'll just follow up on that a little bit in that, um, Lauren, I appreciate how you've kind of 
laid this all out, and I appreciate the conversation. My my sense is that that I don't like making a blanket statement and just sort of like pulling the plug and saying, okay, we're not going to take these anymore. But at the same time, I want I think we're in a position to take. We should be taking a proactive stance about this and not. Yes, we should be partnering with ANR and figuring out what the solutions are. We're, we're not going to solve what pe solve PFAS, you know, sitting around this horseshoe, you know. Um, but what we can do is, is you know, as the council that runs the capital, we we can take a stand on what we're willing to accept. And so that being said, I think the the more sort of forward thinking, proactive we are about what we're willing to accept, which in my mind is the less less is more but understanding that it's a complicated solution the better off we'll be so you know, this is sort of open-ended but i i do think that if if we were to um you know be able to have a meeting with anr be able to set a deadline where like you know after we'll, like if anr gave casella two years then we'll give them a year and say hey you know that that's good great because you're because lauren your point is so well taken they have different Casella has different priorities than a and r and what we might have and so i i still appreciate their priorities but at the same time i think that we need to get ahead of it and and just you know i'm not sure what our action is tonight per se necessarily but like i'm not feeling patient about this because it's a really significant issue so i do think that um, we need to have that sort of more accelerated timeline in mind as a city. So thanks. Jennifer, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to chime in real quick. Um, I appreciate all the work that you've done and taking the time to sit and explain things to me because I too was not aware of what was ab about PFAFs and all these really horrific things and being an Ojibwe woman who is, you know, deeply connected to waters, um, we just had a pipeline through my reservation and through our wild rice fields. And so protecting water is a very important thing to me. And I don't feel okay just handing it off to another community to handle because that's always what happens. And then somebody else is dealing with everybody else's mess. So I think what you're suggesting is something that I, I can sit with with my conscious and and with my water protecting self, I think mm -hmm. giving them a, a short amount of time, like you just said, Jay, I can get down with that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, one of the phrases that comes to mind was uh, from uh, someone who said, you know, we don't want this to be the hot potato, right? Right, that we're just passing around somebody. So how do we, you know, how do we apply how do we best apply pressure and it could be that the best way to apply pressure is to stop uh, but i i think it might be to to make it clear especially for the only vermont player right now um so here's what i would propose that we do as an action moving forward is uh direct staff and or uh lauren or collaborative collaboratively between um staff and lauren to uh to draft uh, a letter with these guidelines um perhaps with a deadline or or if you want to be in on it too you great <laughs> whoever wants to be in on it um and uh i don't know if we need a, a motion on this would it be useful if there was a motion um, I don't think we need a motion okay. unless there was a specific uh, the council wanted to decide on a, a deadline and maybe that's a little early yet to play that card. Um, I, I think it I think that's a, could be a part of the the further conversation once we have a draft in front of us um, something that we could um, digest and and react to. Um, go ahead. Well I, I was actually going to defer to Lauren on this but the only issue I think is isn't isn't there a deadline with a comment period or is this different than that there so there is a comment deadline period november 8th our next council meeting is november 10th i'm fully mm. confident if we give the agency a heads up that we're going to be submitting something a couple of days late as the only off taker that they will still consider our comments seriously so i would not it's easy for me to say I'm not worried about their comments, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, we could, you know, 
I could I could also reach out to A and R, and if it, if there's some urgency on the other end, I don't know about. You know, we could always do a quick noon meeting or something if it's approving a letter. Yeah, but I would I would think it'd be fine for the yeah. next. If meeting. you if you do find out that they are really not going to take those comments on, let's say the 11th or 12th, really, um, let us know and we'll we'll call another meeting. Um, there was some other piece. Oh. One of the other things that I'm very interested in, uh, in conjunction with this topic, is if if we were to stop taking lead shape, how does that affect us? How does the, that affect the wharf uh, financially? Uh, and how does it? Um, we, I mean, we just completed phase one of a major upgrade. Uh, I it's not clear to me like what percentage of our total intake is lead shape, and so will phase one continue to be? Functional, uh, even uh, if if we stop, um, I just think it's important to be eyes open about that aspect. Um, so if we can, along with with that draft, have some further clarification. Um, does that sound like an okay plan, team? Okay, great, thank you, and thank you again for bringing this up. I also want to make it really clear that I think our wastewater treatment, our, our water resource recovery facility is amazing i'm so proud of the work that they do um i think they are um uh, doing an, a wonderfully admirable job and um and it's it's only going to get better so thank you um all right all right so we are i think that's it so we're gonna we're gonna move on for now and so we are up to taking uh well uh, we have a question about uh, petitions for the ballot from CVHHH and uh, from the library, though I think they might have just stepped out. Uh, and... Oh, okay. Sorry, if you need another minute, we can go to another item. Okay, are you ready for the library? Because we couldn't talk and we Oh, yeah. So I, I see we could go in either order. It doesn't really uh, matter terribly, but uh, uh, let's, since you're, you're since here. Since I'm like, standing here? Yep. Go, go <laughs> ahead. Go awesome. ahead. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for uh, adding the library to tonight's agenda. I'm Carolyn Brennan. I'm one of two co-directors of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Uh, with me here tonight is Judy Walk, who is one of two city council appointees to the Library Board of Trustees. Uh, on the Zoom call earlier, but I don't believe he's there now, was Graham Sheriff, who is the other city council appointee. Um, before I get started, I wanted to thank the city and particularly Kevin Casey for helping us with the community development block grant uh, that we received that helped us rebuild our elevator recently. Uh, so tonight, uh, we are asking to be added to the ballot for town meeting. Uh, in the amount of $395,626. Um, for the past three town meeting days, we have re we have requested and received level funding. Uh, so this is our first increase in uh, three years that we're asking for. Uh, we are requesting that the council waive the petition requirement based on our strong and consistent support from the community. Uh, I looked back at our town meeting results from the last decade, and we average about uh, eight, a little over 80% support uh, from the Montpelier community. And um, uh, the last time we requested an increase in, in at town meeting 2019, the council graciously waived the petition requirement to add us to the warning. Uh, and then despite it being an increase year that year, uh, the library article still carried 1567 to 270. Um, so, and I would, I would love to talk about what our year was like, but I don't want to take up a ton of your time. I have <laughs> copies of, uh, I have copies of our annual report that we produced over the summer that has a wonderful highlight of our community impact uh, and where our funding comes from. And, uh, our, and uh, I would love to pass these out to you. I don't know how you feel about handouts. I'm going to keep fine, one unless That's anyone right. objects. Yeah, thank you. So despite the pandemic year and changes in our services, if you walked into the library today, uh, our hours are back to pre-pandemic levels, our services are back to pre-pandemic services. Uh, despite being curbside service only for, oh, for, for some time in this past fiscal year, we still circulated over 290,000 
physical materials and over 33,000 digital materials. Uh, we added in a streaming video service. So now all of our library patrons can access free streaming video uh, from, from their internet connected device. They can download ebooks and audiobooks. They can download and read digital magazines. We have a, a, a wide variety of really wonderful services that we offer. We're back to seeing after school kids, which is very, very exciting for us. Um, and uh, last year we offered, let me see if I can remember, <laughs> over 200 um, programs for adults and children. And our attendance at those, those programs was still up over 9,000, despite them being uh, digital or outdoors. Any questions for Carolyn? What can I tell you about the library? I'm ready to go, guys. Um, I, I did, in the past, when you have, uh, well, I, I wonder if you know this. And in, in the past, when you have had to have to collect signatures, sure. Um, how did how did that happen? Did you just leave something out for people to sign, or sure? So that's part of the issue with this, actually. So we always leave petitions. We we have to petition for um, some of our, our other member communities and. Uh, but particularly in Montpelier, because we need 10% of the um, voter list. Uh, in addition to leaving petitions out in the library, which gets some signatures, we do have to go door to door throughout communities and we do have to go to community events. And of course, uh, that's going to be a significant challenge. And when we were looking at our funding needs for this year, that was those discussions were all happening back in the spring and over the summer when things looked like they were going to significantly improve and perhaps improve and that would perhaps not be as much of a challenge as it's turning out that it would be so uh, I do have a significant concern that uh, it would be particularly onerous to get uh, this the number of signatures that we would need from because there's a lack of community events community events are not advisable right now uh, and um, and uh, I would hate to ask for volunteers to go knocking on people's doors, and I don't know what kind of a response we would get despite strong community support. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? Okay. Uh, so um, at this point, we're going to shift gears. Thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, shift over, I think it's to, to Sandy Roos. Is that right? Okay, so CVHHH. Um, go ahead. Oh, you're still muted. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I actually have just a few slides to share, and I don't know if I can share them or if they're being shared on your end and you have them in front of you. Um, they were shared with Cameron today. She has permission. Okay, um, apparently you have permission, and if you would go ahead and share uh, your slides, um, that would be great. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. And you see the PowerPoint, right? Because I have two screens, so I just want to make sure I get the right one. Sure. So thanks for having us. I am accompanied by two individuals. Um, Kim Farnham is our Director of Community Relations and Development. And also Mary-Kate Mullman is the Vice Chair of our Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice Board, as well as a Montpelier resident. Once again, my name is Sandy Roos and I'm President and CEO. And I had the opportunity to visit with you last year, which was um, really great. I'm going to just give a quick kind of update as to where we're at. And just to let you know that we are asking for a one-year exemption of Montpelier's petition rule and to allow CDHH's funding request to be a line item on the 2022 ballot in the amount of 23,500. So I'm sure many of you are aware of my service, our services and our mission. Um, primarily, we have our feet kind of in many different worlds. We care for individuals, um, prenatal moms, babies, families, all the way to end of life. Um, the majority of our care is provided as medically necessary care. Orders from a doctor are required for that care. And then also promoting the general welfare of our community with health promotion activities, such as all our vaccination clinics and foot care clinics, and then also long-term care services. Those services that are non-medically non necessary 
although there are services that keep individuals in their homes um, and out of long-term care facilities. So for Montpelier residents, um, just to highlight, we care for about 2,800 um, patients per year on any given day. We have about 800 patients on service. We don't see each of those individuals on every day, um, but they're out there. And certainly we cover all of Washington County and three towns in Orange County, Williamstown, Orange, and Washington. Um, in 2021, our service numbers remained quite stable, if not um, increased a bit from, from 2020. And there also are uh, telehealth visits that are not billable, that are not actually shown in some of these numbers as well. So lots to do with our COVID response. I know last year I went into a bit greater detail, but I think the, the biggest thing that really happened for us was our doors remained open the whole time. And there were really only a minimal amount of services that were considered non-essential and more or less by the state, but we really had to triage through those because some of those that are considered non-essential non really are essential. So we had to come up with a plan of how we were gonna deliver these services to individuals in a safe way. And um, still continuing to do that because some of those clients still are fearful with the Delta variant surging and, and all of that, you know, we're really trying to mitigate risk. Um, we accepted all referrals across all programs. We saw COVID positive individuals. We still continue to see COVID positive individuals. Um, certainly the staff, I can honestly say from a workforce perspective, this is probably the worst I've seen it in my tenure of 20 years. And what I wanna say is that I'm really proud of the staff for doing everything they possibly can to meet the needs of their community. So certainly I'm not gonna um, read to you all the, the different things, but I think a lot of the things we really expanded our offerings, bringing care to those in transitional housing and um, certainly we facilitated meal deliveries through the Vermont Everyone Eats programs. We're still continuing to do that. That actually not only helped our clients, but it also helped serve some of our staff and their neighbors as well. And we've done a lot of reach out for those clients that really haven't wanted to have a lot of people in their homes still to this time to really prevent social isolation and make sure they're in touch with those individuals that they really need and are getting the services and care they need. And we did all of this in conjunction with many organizations throughout Central Vermont. We're really fortunate to be in Central Vermont. Um, certainly we do a lot of work with Washington County Mental Health, with the Family Center of Washington County, um, also with the Good Samaritan. So we, we really walk across many um, community partners, and of course, our medical partners at Central Vermont Medical Center, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as Capstone and many others. Really reducing exposure to the virus. The thing that was really um, fortunate for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice is that we were able to be quite nimble. We had a telehealth program that was in place prior to COVID, and really what we did was expand that connectivity. Um, we were really able to shift from in-person visits to video visits to phone visits, whatever seemed to meet the need of that individual. And that was really across the whole system. So in, in looking at this program, we've really um, been able to support statewide um, COVID mitigation efforts. We've worked with programs with um, the Green Mountain United Way to really get families connected. That really helped some individuals that had children that were at home for school. They didn't have Wi-Fi and or they didn't have the equipment and we were able to give them iPads to make that connection, all while taking care of um, families and children as well. So really able to extend our, the breadth and depth of our services. And the biggest thing with our telehealth program is Medicare is our primary payer. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid actually are our primary payers. We have very little commercial insurance. So being able to cost shift doesn't really exist in, in our world. So from the Medicare Medicaid perspective, Medicare doesn't pay for any telehealth services. We still continue to offer them our help, you know, even with our healthcare system being stressed, it's really important that we get eyes on those individuals as much as we can. 
to keep them out of the hospital to really help the surge in the system currently. History of our partnership with Montpelier. We've had a long history of voter support for our town funding request. Last year, 93% of total votes were in favor of our request. Um, as more Montpelier residents qualify for services, we've been able to take them on to service. Once again, workforce really stressed, our staff are tired, you know, but we're really trying to come up with innovative ways to really work with our other partners that are providing care and touching base with these individuals and families and really trying to find creative ways to stay in touch with them, to keep them safe, to keep them at home and get them the care they need. And really providing that essential medical care and going out and doing vaccinations, we're doing boosters, we're still doing testing in the home. Um, there's just a whole host where, you know, flu clinics last year became really important because um, individuals weren't the, the primary care practices weren't conducting their normal clinics like they do to, to actually reduce traffic flow in the practices. We were able to jump in and do extra clinics. We're doing the same thing this year, um, really trying to support those individuals in getting what they need, when they need it, where they need it. Supporting Montpelier residents. So as I mentioned, Mary-Kate Mullman is here joining us this evening. She is vice chair of our board of directors and she is a Montpelier resident, and I thought maybe she could just say a few words. Um, I know she knows some of you and, and certainly has been very actively involved in the healthcare landscape um, in the state of Vermont. So Mary Kate. Probably has to be unmuted. She is, it looks like she's Is it saying, possible to unmute Mary Kate Malman? So, yeah, Mary, Mary Kate, it looks, uh, the, the word is you, you should be able to unmute yourself. Have you tried that? Yeah, it doesn't allow us as participants to unmute ourselves. There we go. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, hi, yes. Thank you for having us here. Um, and thank you, Sandy, for introducing me. I just want to say, I. I've been aware of and involved with CBHH for many, many years. My mom was actually on the board um, back when I was in college. So I've known about them for a very long time. And then I had the opportunity to serve on their board. Um, they've also, I've had personal experience with their services in, in the care of one of my family members. So I know firsthand that they, the quality of the care that they provide and the the well, the well-being of the patients they serve. It's really it's a high priority. Um, and as Sandy mentioned, I'm also in the healthcare policy world. Um, and I just I, I just want to call out how impressed I am with this organization and how they have responded to the COVID um, pandemic and supported our community. Um, I say this like I'm a member of the board. I've been in healthcare policy, and then and also um, I was formerly a, a staffer at the Agency of Human Services. And I was really a part of the rollout of the vaccination effort, and there is so much effort and commitment that people, the vaccinators, um, put in towards working and providing the vaccine to our communities. And CBHH was right at the forefront of doing all of that. So I just want to call them out from those um, those perspectives. And that's that's all I have to say. I just, I'm so thrilled to be um, connected with this organization. Thank you. And so why we need town funds. Um, certainly our, the workforce shortage and the reliance on travel clinicians driving up operational expenses without workforce services wouldn't be there. Um, traveling clinicians isn't ideal. It's not that they're not good people. They're just not from the community. Um, you know, our permanent staff just make certain sacrifices and commitments to their community. Um, that's a huge thing. So they have stood up to bat and they have been there. And like I said, they're tired, but they're still doing it. There's still a lot of work to do. As I mentioned, Medicare is our primary payer. It doesn't reimburse us for our telemedicine visits or any of our telehealth programs. We're gonna to continue to provide this vital service in conjunction with in-person visits in the future. 
it's the right thing to do. It improves quality outcomes. It improves patient experience. And certainly it helps us collaborate with our providers and keep eyes on individuals. They can contact us at any point in time. We have a nurse overseeing that whole program. Um, we are able to you know, really provide that care to those that are underinsured and uninsured. That's how we use these funds too. And to also be able to you know, come into play with some of these community health efforts where the need is needed when it's needed even though there may not be reimbursement for it. And we ensure availability of critical health care for those that are most vulnerable in Montpelier, in central Vermont. We are able to meet that need. Like I said, workforce is a real challenge for us. Um, I can't say it's been easy, but what I can say is staff care about the people that they call their neighbors. Great. Thank you. That's all I have. That was a, a bit quick, but I, I didn't want to hold you all too long. Well, thank you. Uh, so uh, I have the same question for you. If you were to be gathering petitions, um, it, you know, before, before you were, you know, we, we had a history of just like putting you on the ballot. How did you go about that? What did you do? So oh, we actually had to do a lot of different things. Um, some similar to the library, we would put petitions out in certain storefronts, um, in certain stores that we had them there. But primarily, we had our volunteers and board of directors out there at whether they were events or just standing out um, on the streets collecting signatures. And really, I, you know, at this time, as a healthcare provider and an organization that's done so much to mitigate the spread of COVID, I'm not sure how that would be looked upon um, right now. And I know we really struggle with doing that. Most of the towns, if not all of the towns that we are requesting funding from do not have a petitioning process right now. And I know they didn't last year. Um, certainly, you know, I think that's our, our biggest issue. And trying to get you know close to 800 signatures is a lot of work um it takes several months um, and it takes several people in several different situations such as different events and all that which aren't really occurring the way they normally have in the past okay any other questions for sandy uh jeff go ahead um thanks for the presentation um you said you uh, last year served 2,800 residents of Montpelier, which is striking. That's almost 40% of our population. Is that uh, yeah? Is that high this year? That's, is it uh, because of the so pandemic? actually we serve right? We serve about 2,800 to 3,000 patients overall. Um, we served about 400 to 500 patients in Montpelier. Okay, thank you. That, that makes and that's sense. Thank more you. in line. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't count those individuals that we actually see through clinics or we've been doing vaccinations for and um, through foot care clinics, flu clinics, and other sorts of health promotion activity that we do. Those are true either medical or non-medically necessary services under some of the umbrella of our programs, such as home health, hospice, long-term care maternal child health. So uh, my um, uh, understanding of our history is that we have uh, had sort of a, a guiding policy around this, right? Like if, uh, for, for example, with the library, if they were not asking for an increase that we would just put them on the ballot. Um, and this is a year that they are asking for an increase. Um, I'm going to come back to that, but uh, it, and also thinking about um, CVHHH, um, they came to us last year with this request uh, to forego because uh, uh, to forego the the petitions um, because of COVID, um, and I think there was also um, uh, they had been um, separately on the ballot uh, previous to that and had been approved. Uh, and so one possibility is that, because I think it's important that we have some guidelines around this, 
Uh, and so one possibility is that we could say, if you were on the ballot last year um, and were approved, that we could consider putting them on the ballot again without uh, petitions due to COVID. Uh, but we could also, we, but we don't have to do that. What, what are your thoughts, team? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. I mean, my inclination is with that narrow criteria that doesn't open it to uh, to others is to let it go onto the ballot. I mean, I think just the the staffing, the exhaustion of COVID, we're still in the midst of it. We're still trying to minimize gatherings and other things. Um, so to me, I think there's there's some rationale, not open-ended, we'll do this forever, but still being kind of in the thick of pandemic, I'm comfortable with these two particular requests with the narrow criteria that you had to basically get the same approval last year, which is just these two entities. Other thoughts, Connor? Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's value to the petitioning process. I think it results in good community conversations, but it, it's a bit insincere of us, I think, to like be preaching public health and then say, okay, you got to knock on like 2,000 doors to get 500 some signatures. It's, it seems a bit irresponsible, so I, I'm definitely comfortable with these requests. Uh, Jack, did you have something else? Yeah, the uh, the concern I have, and I wasn't on the council when we uh, when we did sort of the two things in tandem. One was to create the uh, the community fund, and two to uh, significantly increase the number of uh, signatures required uh, for petitions to get on the uh, on the ballot. And uh, if the if we're going to get get into a process of regularly granting waivers from uh, from the petition requirement, I, I just wonder if that raises the question. You know, if the pitch is, oh, it's just too hard to get this many signatures, which I recognize it's hard to get that many signatures. Did did we go too far? Did we? Is, is it too many that we're asking uh, organizations to get? And we, should we review the whole the whole uh, system that we have, including the number of signatures that are required and the uh, and the community fund uh, part of the pa package too? That's uh, not we're not going to fix that today. But uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, Sean, can I ask you to to weigh in on this? Um, it, it's what percentage of the population to get a moneyed item? It's 10%, which it's is 10%. about 600. Okay. And was that changed recently? Like within the last five years? No, not within the last five years. Yeah. That was changed. Oh, the last 15 years. Oh, 15 years. Oh. Well, it was more recent than that because I was here. Um, <laughs> it, it was 10 years ago. I think it was the first year. When was it changed from? It was straight oh, up 5% five, five percent for everything. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, that's possibly a thing to consider for another time, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't expecting we'd. Yeah. Let's just change it right now. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, I want to add a slightly different perspective and, and support both of these requests. One, get it, gathering signatures and getting within six feet of somebody and passing clipboards back and forth is a health risk that shouldn't be imposed upon anybody right now. But if the city were slightly bigger, it would have its own health department. In effect, home health and hospice is doing much of the work that our city health department would, would be doing with vaccinations and checking on people. Similarly, the library is maintaining public bathrooms and public computers and accommodating a lot of the unhoused uh, when the city has fumbled ro royally on that. So. I would, you know, encourage you to look at how these, in effect, are are complementary services uh, that should be unquestioned as far as funding them. And in fact, some of the COVID money uh, that uh, we didn't anticipate doubling uh, should be considered for both of these as well. Um, but the fact that the library does a better job of ventilating, you know, and, and maintaining public access than uh, even our city council chamber is, uh, is, is noteworthy. Thank you. Uh, all right, so is there, uh, I think we need a motion. 
um, for this. So uh, is, uh, yeah, Connor. Yeah, sure, ahead. I'll move to approve both requests to waive the petitioning requirement and put both organizations on the ballot for the uh, specified amount. A second. Yep. Like what? Oh. I mean, we, we could. I mean, does that need to be in the motion? Or I guess my, my thought on that is if you don't state that now, if you say that now, it's really clear. Otherwise, we'll have other groups come in and say, okay. you know, we wanted to petition, but it was hard and you approved them. So, you know, you can say this is, these were the, the conditions under which we approved these two. The same conditions that you approved them both last year, basically. Does that make sense, Connor? It does. I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with the blanket at this point, because I think there could be exceptions that we haven't thought about uh, with needs specifically with organizations providing like sort of COVID services. And I just want I wouldn't want to take it off the table anyways. But generally, I agree with the, with the <laughs> principles laid out. Perhaps that we can um, at least consider that that is those are the guidelines that we are uh, moving forward with at the moment. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so there was a motion, a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Yes, and thank you, Thank Sandy. you so much. I yeah. appreciate it. I hope yeah. I was picking up. <laughs> yes, okay. thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. So I just want to give us a heads up at 830. We are going to take a break. Um, Dan, that may be, uh, I don't know where that will fall in your presentation, but I just want to give you that heads up. Um, minutes. You can do it. Yeah, I, I have faith. You're going to be great. <laughs> uh, so uh, to the, the DID pre uh, budget presentation, um, Dan. Go ahead. I will be done by 8.20 if you oh. let me. Awesome. <laughs> we'll hold you to it. <laughs> Go for it. Um, uh, can I share my screen, please? Yeah, I. Uh, we just got a thumbs up from Cameron. Now I can. Great. Um, can everyone see this? Yes. Great. Um, so thank you. Um, this is our annual tradition of being late at getting a TIT um, budget approved um, for this is for the fiscal year that we that started July 1st. Um, we're on a different fiscal year than the city so um, our spending doesn't quite line up and that's how we end up I think being late in your process sometimes so I apologize for that. Um, uh, essentially, we are at, uh, our budget operates under the same amount of money. The uh, assessment has not changed since the downtown improvement district was um, started in 2013. Um, approximately sixty thousand dollars total. That's two pieces. The um, the sort of general downtown improvement district uh, tax on the commercial property, and then the pilot funds for state properties that um, fall in the district um, for the equivalent amount. Um, we're asking for the same breakdown across general categories. Um, that's marketing, downtown beautification, um, event grants. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give an overview of um, how we plan to spend that next year, uh, this, <laughs> this year, um, and how we have spent that in the uh, last year. So the first category um, being marketing, um, and the biggest project that we're working on is a new website. Um, some of you may know that we share the same back end as the city's website. Um, I think you heard today and all generally agree that the city's website has some challenges. Um, and um, we're really excited about launching a new website that will better serve both um, local residents and visitors to Montpelier, um, will be easier to navigate, um, more dynamic, updated, more frequently and easily, um, et cetera. Um, so this is a big project. Um, there was some funding for this project in the last DID year and additional funding in this current year. Um, the total cost of the redesign is about $22,000. Um, and um, so it's a big project, it's an ongoing project. Um, and I'm really excited to launch it, um, hopefully at the end of this calendar year, if not, 
early in next year. Um, some of the things we've done in the last year and examples of what we do with DID funds, um, we did a campaign with Seven Days, um, <clears throat> their brand studio, which is sort of advertorial paid um, editorial content, essentially. Um, they said that that was the most successful campaign of the sort that they've ever done. Um, over 300,000 impressions across various channels, including a print spread um, in their sort of um, stay tripper section, which is like for uh, Vermont residents to encourage people to travel throughout the state during the pandemic when we couldn't have visitors from out of state. We leveraged a state of Vermont grant for this um, and had a contest component that allowed us to track the economic impact and nearly 10,000 in direct trackable impact. And that's just people who came and actually entered the contest as a result of the campaign. Um, leveraging funds is something um, we do a lot with this money. As you know, we don't receive any administrative costs under the downtown improvement district. So all of the staff time that goes into managing all of this is paid for out of other Montpelier Live funds. Um, a digital ad campaign with Vermont Public Radio that had 67,000 impressions, um, encouraging people to shop online um, with Montpelier businesses. Um, holiday advertising campaign. Um, this is the bridge, the world, is in the Times Argus, um, other area media, the point um, about shopping in Montpelier. Um, and the other uh, big project that we've done over the last year is a market research study, um, which is really helping us understand who's coming to Montpelier, why they're coming to Montpelier, and will help make our future communications more targeted and effective. The second category is downtown beautification. Again, same request uh, for the categories last year. This is divided between holiday decorations, uh, downtown flowers and plantings, um, public art projects, and a contribution that we make to the city's public art commission, which we helped found. Um, some of the examples of what we've done are on this page. I won't name them all, but that includes new, new work and maintenance of existing work. 900 feet of fresh garland wrapped around 60 light poles, um, 47 hanging flower baskets um, that we water, in install, remove every year. Um, this was our one of our public art projects at the Transit Center. Maintenance of the mural in the 60 State Street parking lot, projection of some holiday decorations um, on the side of the Rome Vermont building on Langdon Street a wreath project where we had community members decorate wreaths and hang them on the link, uh, Rialto Bridge. The uh, next category is our event grant program. Um, this supports events that take place in the downtown. We also provide um, 10 hours at least of consultation services and technical support for these events, promotional support, access to all of our event stuff like our sound system, our sandwich boards, our walkie talkies, so on and so forth. Here are three of the events and a lot of creative pandemic solutions. Um, you'll see uh, on the left is um, an event that Shida Projects did this year on July 3rd. In spite of the terrible weather, they had a lovely turnout. Um, the top right is Scrag Mountain Music doing a uh, Zoom performance from Bear Pond Books as part of a series of pop-ups that they did at local businesses. And the bottom right is um, a performance that was at, uh, outside at the Kelly Colbert Library um, that we helped uh, fund. Um, so that's, uh, that's my presentation. It's 8.20 exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, uh, so you have no time for questions or comments, sorry. <laughs> that is impressive. <laughs> You've done this before. Um, any questions for Dan? No? Okay. Uh, well, so just coming back to what... I don't think uh, yes, you, well, we, you we need, need to approve yeah, this they, budget. These are technically city funds. They're, they're through our downtown improvement district tax. So we collect the money and then appropriate it to, um, we've, we've allowed Montpelier Live to prepare a budget and use for it. And you've approved that. We do include this in our annual budget. So you do need to actually vote to approve yeah. their budget. Is there such a motion? Jack, go ahead. 
when I reviewed the uh, packet, I was actually thinking, well, we should just put this on the consent agenda. We this is we we should definitely do this. So I I move that we approve the <laughs> I move that we approve the uh, proposed budget. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, anyone online? Okay. Um, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Great. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, for sure. Um, since we are at eight twenty-one right now, I would suggest that maybe we take our break right now. What do you think about that, team? Okay. Sure. And so let's meet back at uh, eight thirty-one in ten minutes, and we'll pick up um, with the budget overview. Uh, process. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, I'm going to um, uh, turn it over to Kelly, unless you want to say anything first. Uh, yeah, oh, actually, okay. I'd like to turn this over to Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, wonderful. I'll take it from here. Um, so no guarantees that I'm going to be as fast as Dan. Um, that was amazing, um, but I'll try. Um, and I can be a little bit of a fast talker, but I'll try to slow it down. So a little counterintuitive, but we'll get started here. Um, I've got a slide deck, um, which is included in um, the packet for you, and it's representative of the memo that was also provided. Um, and generally, um, this um, presentation will give you kind of a snapshot in time of where we're starting the budget process. Um, and adequate mic. I was wondering that. A little closer, I, I, that I can do. Is that good? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so it looks like screen's up, so we'll get started here. Um, so I'm gonna get started um, with some of the assumptions. Ooh, this is a little off center. It's not on the Zoom screen, just on the pro pro projector we okay. have the picture. Are you, are you all good with this? Okay, all right, then I'm just gonna go with it then. Oh, okay, are you, are you good? Okay, all right. Um, so essentially, uh, there are just a couple points in the assumptions that I do wanna highlight. Um, first and foremost is that um, the targets were set um, at 3% up um, from the FY22 budget. Um, that is representative of a blended rate of CPI. It's also reflective of what the states um, rate for budget development is as well. Um, and so I've been watching CPI a little bit. It's been increasing um, as we've been moving on here. So we'll see what happens as we get underway. Um, but this is a pretty conservative estimate um, for folks to build their budgets on. It also assumes no growth in the grand list, which is a little bit of a, a little bit of a wind at our back, um, if you will. And then there are some items down at the bottom that I do really wanna, um, well, actually one thing in particular in the middle, health insurance is actually down, um, which is amazing by 5% based on what's been proposed. Um, we're keeping that level because we're not sure what will happen with COVID and if there will be impacts in the calendar year next year, which would then impact the second half of FY23. So would you like questions now or at the end? I can take them whenever. This is a question about the presentation. I don't know what you're showing on the screen, but we're still seeing just the cover page oh. of your uh, presentation. On, All right, uh, let's see what Zoom. we, sorry about that. Hmm, if I can, what about I now? Know, I don't know if you guys on the other yep. side are the same thing. That explains the confused looks. <laughs> uh, is it like crashing? What's it doing? I don't know. Why don't we stop the share and restart? <laughs> Let's try this again. A little bit of. Let's try this one. Yeah. Share. Start. That better? Uh, no. Yeah. Weird up there, but good online. It's good, good on Zoom. Zoom. And if yeah. I click through the slides, or am I moving? Oh no, I'm adding slides now. That's not. <laughs> that's not. That is not at all what I wanted to do. I'm going to leave it just in this presentation form then, if that's good, and just keep going. 
Now there's a movie. Oh, it's not moving. Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Let's we're gonna get this. Let's see. Try screen two. Screen this one here. Uh-huh. Can I no? Hmm. Just clicking everything now. <laughs> See what happens. I don't know. Hmm. I'm trying to stop share. Sorry, everyone at home, if you're getting a uh, whiplash from this. <laughs> I'll put the link to this presentation in the chat so people at home can follow along and you can just share without sharing your screen. Okay. I can take it from there too. Let's see. No. Is this the same presentation that is? It, it's the same one that's linked, that's linked. Yep. in the uh, yeah, agenda, right? Yes. So we could theoretically follow along yes. from that. Yep. Okay. So maybe I'm just going to. Jennifer, I'll print you one right now. Thank you. What I will do is I'm going to stop my share then. <laughs> I'm a mess. I'm not a <laughs> so you say, I have one printed. Good ears. <laughs> hmm. Strange. Or just me. <laughs> whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but if we're good, I'll just keep kind of moving through this, um, and folks can kind of follow along at home. Um, so we'd gone through the targets, um, the health insurance. And then um, I was going to start to get into some of the new items that are in the instructions for um, FY23. Um, one is accepting proposals for new positions if they can be adequately funded um, and with justification, of course. And then also any new initiatives should consider the city's FY21 equity assessment and then also align with the strategic plan. Um, and so departments have been working to that end um, and things have been getting underway pretty nicely. So we'll try to share my screen as I get on here. I've got a presentation of the new budget development platform that I did want to give everyone a demo of that's pretty exciting. So um, hopefully that'll work out. Um, so these um, key dates are the next slide. Um, and some of the dates have shifted just slightly as it relates to um, getting into sort of capital planning. Um, we're on target um, right now, as of the 22nd, we have received most all uh, capital submissions from departments. Um, we're working to get um, an internal group together to review those submissions, and then we'll work to schedule um, some time with the CAP committee based on the outcome of those meetings. Um, I also am working to put together a survey for public input. Um, so then we can kind of see, you know, what what the thoughts are uh, within the community. Um, and then there are a few other dates um, <laughs> here. Submissions are due on November 15th to us. Uh, budget Congress is where we meet to review as a staff all of the budget submissions. Um, that's happening on the 16th and 17th. Uh, we're looking to get any bond proposals by the 1st of December. Um, and then the December 8 meeting touches off the um, presentation from the city manager's office on the proposed budget to kind of touch off your process. And so then that'll kind of kick off the council deliberations. And then that'll take um, from the 8th through January 20th when um, the town meeting warning needs to be officially warned. And then town meeting day is on March 1st. So that's kind of a rough sketch of the calendar um, as it is right now. Um, one thing, can I just toss one thing in there that we just don't have it on there? Oh, never mind, we do. Capital Improvement Committee meeting. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we'll have more to come on that. Um, we're working through the process. It's really great to have a calendar so we can stay on task, but. Um, it's also just making sure that we get everything in um, for consideration there. So more to come on specific dates. Um, this year, we are using a budget development platform called ClearGov, um, and it's pretty exciting. It's um, a dashboard based uh, application that all departments have access to, and we're using it for all funds, which will be really nice as it flows into our uh, budget book. 
So I'm going to skip a few slides here. I'm going to see if I can actually um, take and just show you an example of a budget book. Maybe. And I'll try to share my screen here. So this on the screen here is, oh, let's see if I can share this screen. Nope. Oh, sorry, Cameron, thank you. Um, so, thank you. Okay, you see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> Something's working. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so this screen here is, this is the city of Malden. Um, they are also a ClearGov user, um, and this is their FY22 budget book. So we'll be having a website this year, and also this book can be published in a printed version as well. Um, and so what's really neat about this is everything that we do within the system flows into this book. And so just looking at, you know, sort of generally um, on the introductions tab here, there's a bunch of things here, some really cool things like demographics. Um, if I scroll down here, you can kind of see some of them. Um, so it just kind of gives you some insights into, you know, our city as a whole. There's also a really neat um, elected officials page here within the book, which gives some bios and pictures of the mayor yeah. and council. Um, so pretty, pretty fancy. Um, and then there's more traditional things that we have in our budget book year over year, like the organizational chart. Um, and then just some of the financial policies that will be uploaded as part of our budget book that we do have available in the council handbook, um, but then also be showcased here within this um, platform. Um, and then just moving on to the budget overview, this is where it looks pretty neat. Let me show you some of these. Um, so this executive overview is, you know, Bill's summary that he does year over year. Um, and then we've got some other factors here that um, I think will be nice and timely. Some of the short term factors that the city's been facing um, will be highlighted. And then um, this piece here is pretty exciting to me and it may be to you as well as some of the personnel detail that will be identified in this budget. So we'll have a module that will identify changes within personnel year over year and then also um, really kind of dive into that detail. Um, so then I want to show you what the fund summaries look like. And so each fund is broken down in this summary dashboard form. Let me see if I can just minimize that a little bit, make it a little bit better for you. Um, and so what you'll see is you can toggle over any of the graphs and so it's interactive and so you can kind of see the totals um, year over year. Um, and then as you get on, you can kind of see what is comprising that fund. Um, and so it's pretty user friendly and then you've got sort of the nuts and bolts down below with all the line items. Looks good. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> um, and so then um, you can do that with any of the funds. Um, and then um, just taking an example here. So the fire department, um, this is what their page would look like and also what the page would look like if it were printed. Um, and so it just gets into some of the summaries here globally for their budget, all funds. Um, and you can get into expenses by type and you can really see, you know, how the budget sort of operating personnel is comprised and then the line items. Um, so we're using this platform to not only develop the budget, but then also using it to feed through into our budget book, which will save a ton of time and then also be way more user friendly um, for the public, but then also I think um, for our record keeping as we go through the process and our ability to be transparent. Um, and so there's another piece that I do also want to share with you that is part of this um, application is we have access also to a transparency site, which is kind of neat because it just pulls, you know, the data from the budget um, development, but then also some of the other factors like the demographics um, and such. And then there's also some ability to create data sets um, to then publish for the public. So I'll show you this one. Oh, 
So, okay. Um, so this is just the overview page. And so this is the demographic snapshot. You saw a little bit of that in the budget book. Um, so you, these are pulled from the census. It's a little bit stale and dated just because these numbers are coming from the, looks like the 2000 census here, um, but hopefully they'll get updated as we get on, which is kind of nice. Um, then you get sort of your financial overview. What's really cool here is you can toggle between different funds. So if you wanted to see um, what different funds look like from you know revenue, revenue or expense um, breakdown, and then it's, it's charted down below. And then we've got this open checkbook feature, which we kind of do now on our website, but this is just a, a I think a more user-friendly way to kind of see the vendors that we're paying um, sort of in a checkbook form. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to get into here, which is kind of exciting and also part of the budget book is we will have project pages like this. Um, and so we'll likely select five or so to publish within the transparency page, but something like East State Street would have its own page. And so then you have program details and any of the documents that staff wants to share um, so that you can really see where it falls within the city. And then you can get more detail aside from just the um, normal um, presentation, which is just in summary form within our current budget book. And then this dashboard piece is something that um, hopefully we'll be able to develop in short order, but in time we definitely will. But what I wanted to highlight here is um, the police department. Um, there are some neat um, data sets here that are available within the transparency site to share with folks. So calls for service or, you know, whatever whatever we wanted to develop or put up here um, just to, to, you know, share with the public um, so they can be in the know. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop my share and then just kind of continue through sort of the rest of the presentation um, as it is. And at this point, I'm on the revenue projections slide. Um, and so that's just over after the examples portion. Um, and so just running through this quickly in a nutshell, you know, things are looking better. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pent up demand, there's a lot of uh, need for resources and so, you know, we are projecting that revenues will come in higher um, on both the general fund side and also on the parking fund side, which is where we were losing um, some revenue. Um, but, you know, things are still slow to return. And so based on these projections on the general fund side, there's about $630,000 additional that I think we're going to pull in and it may be more but this is a pretty conservative estimate. And then parking fund annually, I think we'll get about $50,000 there that will come in. Um, and so that's good. It's just with all that we need to fund, it's gonna be tricky. Um, so then moving on um, to the other side of the equation where the pressure is. Question? Questions, yeah. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. Have we had conversations about the pilot perspective? Like, doesn't it sound this year over what? We had hoped, anticipated, yeah. it, and just curious if those conversations have happened or if this is just actually what. So, we um, actually didn't end up receiving our pilot payments from the state. And so, that's what's good um, and, and fantastic, which we didn't anticipate in our projections because we, we took a very conservative approach in that we saw that local options taxes were not coming in the way that we thought they were going to, and we weren't sure what was going to happen at the state level. Um, ultimately, we did end up receiving that funding, um, and it seems as though we'll receive it, you know, ongoing. Um, and so that's good news. Um, but local options tax is still down, and so is parking. Thank you. Sure. Um, so then getting on to sort of the pressure side of uh, things. Um, Right now, in the set of assumptions um, that I'm working off of, just to give you sort of broad strokes, um, it's the last year of the capital plan in FY23 before we're going to need to do a major um, reconstruction. And so there's about $2.5 million or so that we have, you know, sort of in the plan for capital spending. Um, that includes debt service, projects, and equipment. Um, and so what will be interesting, especially in light of all of the things that are on the table um, 
is how you know we'll be able to spread those resources. Um, and so then uh, moving on into personnel costs, um, contributing factors, we've um, negotiated with all four unions. And so those uh, costs are included here. Um, this is a estimate at this point. Um, once we start to drill into the numbers a little bit more, the things might fluctuate a little bit. And it also includes um, the increase for um, the non-union folks. Um, and so there's about $375,000 there in pressure. Um, and that's with all vacant positions filled. Um, and then moving on there, uh, there's a little bit of pressure associated with um, insurances. We don't have them all yet. The big one we do have, and which is health insurance, which is a really great uh, thing to, to have locked in at this point. Um, but the others we've got to really take care to, to look at, um, such as workers' compensation um, and some of the other insurances, just to make sure that we're sort of on par there. So this is just an estimate placeholder. Um, so all told, um, you know, there, there is going to be pressure associated with personnel and we'll keep track of it. And as we get underway, um, we'll share with you updates as we load the positions into Infinite Visions and do the official projections, which we have not done yet. Um, but we are scrubbing those positions actively right now. Um, so then on into some of the operating line item estimates that, you know, are points for discussion. Um, IT investment and alignment is a piece that I want to bring up. We are overrunning our contract right now, um, just because there's a lot of need there. Um, there is a lot on the back end in terms of moving to the cloud and all of the IT infrastructure that's needed, but then there's a lot that's needed to support employees and their remote work. And so we're really feeling that pressure. Um, and so right now, if projections continue, we're about $60,000 up. This also includes some items associated with some of the platforms that we will need to contemplate replacing, such as Ticket Track, um, which is beyond its life right now. Um, and then there are some other modules that Public Works uses, like Manager Plus and such. So um, there's pressure with IT, um, and we're trying our best to kind of get that down as much as we can, but also weighing that with the need and also being secure um, with the public utilities and all of that. Um, then um, we are in the second year of payment for our reappraisal. Um, so there's only two years for that. The total contract was $260,000, um, but I'm highlighting it here um, because it's still a payment that's gonna come due in 23 as we round out the process. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we've got some ADA projects here in City Hall. The biggest one is the elevator, but there are other things too included. Um, and then um, a really large expense um, that would be a point for discussion is the TIF bond um, and the garage expenses that you know, we will need to consider what we wanna do with them. Um, and so at this point, um, that's over $1.1 million. Um, and at some point we will have to um, cut our losses so that then there's not a liability on the general fund. So those are the operating highlights, um, some you know things to consider. And then getting on to some of the other pressures within this budget um, that are definitely worth noting, but, um, and you know, up for debate, um, you know, are, are, are pretty important. Um, Confluence <laughs> Park, or these are in no particular order, but I just wanted to kind of lay everything out there. Um, Confluence Park, there's, the staff has done, and the community has done a really good job of fundraising for this and has come up with a lot of the money. I think we've got um, $600,000 or so covered already, um, but we need an additional 300 to 500,000 to complete that project. Um, parking meters right now, um, our credit card acceptance at those meters is outdated with old technology. We would have to upgrade those meters if we were going to continue to use credit cards at the meter. We can just use Park Mobile, but it's something to talk about whether or not we want to just do point and Park Mobile or credit cards. Um, so if we were to choose to continue with all of those services right now, it would be an additional 270 
thousand to come up to speed. Um, then you get LED street lights for 120k, Ferry Street intersection for 550,000, Route 2 sidewalk, 225,000. The Route Road Bridge is listed here. There's a grant that we did receive for this bridge. Um, and so this is part of it. The total project cost is $507,000 um, and has been sort of on the list of things to complete for quite some time. Um, and then moving on from there, um, the East State Street project um, is $7 million and $3 million of that is general fund. We did get some good news that we got some grant money to cover the utility side of that equation, um, but we'll still need to come up with a, a good a chunk of change for that project to be completed. And then, as was mentioned earlier, the CVPSA funding um, is noted here, you know, as it might be a decision item. Um, as we come on down the line, we've got about a one point um, one million or so um, sort of stake in that project, and so we'd have to just see, you know, what that that means um, as continued discussions happen. Um, and then also noted there, we last year in the capital fund, we did have a little bit of money for con schools. And so that's also something to consider here um, as we move forward. Um, and then we've got other community needs that have been identified, um, such as the homelessness task force, housing trust fund, um, community survey, and capital needs assessment for our citywide buildings and infrastructure. And then there's the net zero plan um, that does have uh, some dollars attached to it and also the police review committee recommendations. Um, so there's quite a list. Um, and once we get the list from departments, um, this is a generalized list, but there may be additions to that list, but just sort of this in general summary. Um, and then moving on to sort of the, the gap um, sheet or slide, as I would call it, um, if we were to fund sort of the, the, the general items, um, then, you know, we would be still looking at a little bit of a gap that we would need to be, that we would need to cover, that would be above and beyond the 3% target based on inflation, which would be about 5%, um, or um, just under $800,000, which is, um, including the increased revenues that we are projecting at this point. So as we get on, we'll continue to scrub the numbers and see what they look like. And I'm sure I'll be back to provide updates and hopefully good news, um, but no guarantees, unfortunately. Um, and um, we'll continue to work through the budget development process, but um, this general um, context is how the departments have been briefed too. So it's pretty conservative um, to keep us safe. Um, but, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty um, related to the conditions that we're in. And so things are getting better. They're just not fully recovered yet. Um, so I think this budget build will be tricky to say the least because there's just a lot of pent up demand. Um, and so next steps for us, um, we are um, working with departments to go through their budgets right now. Um, they are using the ClearGov software and it has been awesome. Um, sort of a point by point, line by line review. Um, so we're really getting into all the details. Um, we'll continue to sort of scrub those as we get on. Um, and then we're really taking a keen eye towards what's in the base budget to make sure that it still makes sense. Um, in some cases that may harvest us a little bit of savings. And in some cases we're seeing, especially with energy costs and some of the supply costs, um, it's getting a little bit expensive, and but it's also reflective of what things are actually um, costing. Um, we're also going to work to leverage uh, state and federal funds, and so there are things that are starting to trickle out from the state um, based on federal funding, and hopefully there will be more to come. And so as we consider ARPA and how to use those dollars, hopefully, um, you know, other funding will be part of that conversation as well. <laughs> Um, and then we're also evaluating right now, as I mentioned, ARPA, the categorical eligibility for ARPA, um, because, you know, well, we did lose revenue in some instances, we didn't lose as much as our projections. Um, and so that's a good thing. 
but then we also just need to make sure that then we can use the money with the broadest category and avoid mm -hmm. clawback. So we're just um, looking into that now too. And so that'll be part of the conversation as we proceed. Um, and so we'll lock the budget into ClearGov and into Infinite Visions, which is our accounting system. And we'll have a budget for you on the 8th. And so if you have questions. A number of questions, but go ahead, Lauren. Well, just one on the point about the federal and state funding. I mean, I'm wondering if we should invite the representative Mary Cooper in soon to talk to us about like how the state's thinking about funding and any opportunities she sees for a city like Montpelier. I mean, I know you all are thinking about it, but just better understanding where the opportunities might be. So if there's things that might not have been on our next year list, but might make sense if there's a funding opportunity, um, just making sure we're aware of all of those. Um, just one idea. <clears throat> uh, a couple questions. So well, this uh, software sounds amazing. Um, uh, wondering about whether or not we will have the kind of uh excel sheet that we've had in the past to manipulate numbers ourselves and play with things uh to see how uh, how it impacts yeah. in bottom lines and etc okay so we'll still have that yeah. that's great and the yeah. software should be able to do that too <clears throat> change right in at live okay uh I would assume that if, if we were playing with it on our on our own, we would not have access to that. So, okay, this is uh, as, as long as uh, we have something that we can um, sort of uh, manipulate. Uh, that that's that was very useful, I think, in the past for us. Um, I noticed in the uh, uh, memo that you you all cite uh, CPI right now for the Northeast is about. Was it three well, percent? Well, so it in or four. August, it was four. Yeah, it was four point four. Yeah, and then in four. September it's four point six, and so it is going up. Yeah. Well, and and um, I also just noticed that cola right now is like five point nine percent. Um, and is does that? I mean, I guess cola really would mostly factor into uh. uh uh, personnel, you know, like salaries and whatnot, but those have been negotiated generally. So, uh, but that doesn't otherwise come into your uh, considerations. I mean, it's in the mix. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and I think those are, that leads also to where you all end up knowing those kind of costs because yeah. I think when we started this, we picked three because we knew that's what the state was doing and that's kind of where we've been. But, you know, as you can see, we're really at like five. So, yeah. you know, maybe that's not off. So, and know. from the list of projects that you, I mean, there were there are many potential projects, right? Uh, and some of them may be eligible for ARPA money and some of them may not be. But um, one of the things that I, I may just give you a call tomorrow <laughs> about this, uh, because I, I'm about to hit send on a budget survey to the council. Um, and one of the questions I would like to be asking in that is uh, for the council, what potential bonds uh, are you interested in at least having a conversation about? And so, but I, I feel like I need to have a list of like, what are those bonds? And I can provide you with a list. What's that? I can provide you the list that uh, Public Works has come up with and that we've worked on for our debt service calculations that are in the memo, just for ideas. That that would be great. And the, the thing is, like, I know some of them might even be able to be grouped together because they're similar, or um, or do we split them all out? I I'm not sure what's the best. I, I'm not sure what's the most useful to you all. Um, but anyway, we can talk about that. Or if you can send me that list, and uh, if I have questions, we can I can follow up so I can send out the, the budget survey. So, yeah, I mean, I think obviously the more we know about your thinking, the better. And looking at the strategic plan and trying to pull <clears throat> projects from that, you know, I hope we don't like reprioritize stuff you've already prioritized. So I think we want to look at that too. Um, and at some point, we can even maybe use a ranking, you know, thing like you did with the with the uh, strategic plan. Normally, what would happen is we would have this list, we'd 
here the council's input, we would draft this and then the council's capital improvements committee would look at that and that's when we weigh in and then come to the council for, for consideration. So I don't know if that's what we had anticipated doing, but I think getting some early weigh in to get her. Well, and to that end, <laughs> and anyone have thoughts? <laughs> um, oh. Oh, Carol Plant. Uh, thank you. Uh, Carol, if you have a comment now. Oh, no, oh, wait, that's no, the, the oh, that's just the, no. oh, yeah. that's just the cursor. Never mind. Sorry about that. <laughs> Nonetheless, Carol, if you have something you want to say. That's okay. um, uh, but otherwise, uh, um, any other thoughts, comments from council on, or questions um, on the budget so far? Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, just one more time, you're hoping to have a budget uh, to start with in front of us by um, December 8th. December 8th. December 8th. Okay, so we have another couple meetings yep. to have some preliminary discussions. Uh, okay, if we if we want to, <laughs> or at least the, you'll have the survey results by then. Yeah. So we'll be. Um, let's just run back to. You. So you have meetings on the 10th and the 17th. Um, by the 17th, we will have already had our, we call it our budget Congress, but that's just really when we get everybody in a room and work through the budget. So we will have completed that probably that day. So if you were to then say something different, we'd have to scramble, but that's okay. We'd still yeah. have a couple weeks to do that, but okay. certainly next meeting. Would be. Okay. And, and I say that it's not like it's final when you get it on the 8th. I mean, you'd still then have two months to make whatever changes you all want to make. So it's right. not like we're just giving you a recommendation mm -hmm. and you then put your magic on it. So, so I, I'm hoping to send out this budget survey by tomorrow. And uh, if once I get this, this last piece of information, and then I think it would be great if we could have folks uh, reply to that by uh, at least the Friday before the uh, 10th. So we can, that can be a part of your, okay thinking. Okay. Anything else you need from us at this point? Okay. No. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nice thanks job. for your, your Thank diligence you. on this. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> and we were looking forward to showing off the software to you in part because we think it's really great and the public's going to really like it, but also the budget books that you get will look differently this year than they have in all the years past. So right. thought we'd give you at least heads up on that. But yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah. It, you know, it does, just to make a comment on the budget in general, it, it does feel like, if I, I guess I was feeling what, what you were saying, Kelly, about like, feels like there's pent up demand. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, I, I, I'm just speaking for myself, like, I, I want to be able to help meet that demand. But if there, there may be such a thing as going overboard. <laughs> so uh, I'm just holding that intention uh, right now. And I'm very interested to see how, how that, that tension plays out uh, and w what we are able to build back uh, sort of within reason, if that makes sense. Um, with a lot of hope that we can be taken care of uh, some of these things, at least with ARPA money, I know a, a lot of it might be going to to uh, replace canceled projects, but there's still a lot to be discussed. So, um, anyway, that's uh, any any other comments folks want to make generally about the budget at this point? No, no pressure. Okay. All right. Super. All right. Thank you. And I think we are ready to uh, move on to the strategic plan. <laughs> Well, yay, Very welcome. Exciting. <laughs> All right, give me a second. Let's see if we can actually make the um, screen share work. That would be super great. Um, so thank you for letting me come and speak to you about the strategic plan. I think we're super close to passing a final draft. I hope everyone has had time to review that. Um, we can go through that today as well, but I'd like to start with sort of walking through the initiatives that you prioritized and just checking in, gut check on how you feel about those. Um, I did include them in the draft um, strategic plan that I sent out in the priority that y'all had individually with your rankings. 
um, because I didn't want us to get too far behind schedule. So I'll first start with the initiatives and just walk through them so that it, you know, the public is aware of where those rankings ended up. And then we can go into the draft um, if anyone has any edits or comments or feedback, if that sounds good. So we'll see if I can actually do that. The big screen. Well, can you see it on so your yes. Zooms? Yes, but you have the slides, side slides, but yes. Is it working now? Yeah, uh, no, you're back to, yep. It looks like you haven't started this. Oh man, y'all. <laughs> I'm gonna try this again. <laughs> I don't know why this is working earlier and it is not now, but that's just how it is, I think. Just don't know how to make it not do that. Not so see that. Just the live is the dance, but it's not on our screens. Well, not yet. No, I'm just trying to make sure. Anyway, well, we'll see what happens. We'll just go through it in any ugly way, and everyone can see it, and it'll be fine. <laughs> it will be fine. All right, we're just going to go through it this way. So. Um, Individually, council members were asked to rank their initiatives that were discussed at our last um, council meeting where we discussed this. So as individuals, you were asked to rank them. I then took weighted scores from all of your <coughs> rankings. I then combined those um, for an average score. Those were considered higher scores. So I guess I will restate that because I realized that didn't make any sense as I said it out loud. Initiatives that were a weighted score above the average for each initiative were considered higher priority. And those with a score below the average for each goal were considered lower scores. So that kind of makes sense when you see them here. So for goal one, improve community prosperities, y'all had a lot of initiatives that supported the strategies that you already voted on. The ones here highlighted in green were those that had higher scores and therefore what I included into the draft strategic plan. So I'll just please holler out if you have any questions or concerns about any of these, or if you wanted to change them or challenge a ranking, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just sort of walk through these, maybe read the top three um, for each goal. So for goal one, improving community prosperity, prioritizing recreation and parks as an economic driver, prioritizing rivers for economic development and conservation, and, and incentivizing new businesses that serve working class residents were your top three priorities for initiatives. Move. Yep. yep. Confused how it syncs up, Blake. So we got one, study providing childcare. The other one, provide childcare, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, so all of those are sort of being combined into our work plan. So okay, okay. when you see the actual strategic plan, it has those as called out initiatives. And then what it is is up to staff to say, here's how I would do that for them. If we're going to look at providing work. So that was a separate one, providing child care available from eight to six. Right now we don't, we do an aftercare program. And so for us, our understanding of that is you want to expand our child care program. The other one is let's try to get child care for infants. We don't have the capacity to do that right now, but how do we get there? Provide council the roadmap to how to get there. So those are two separate right. items that it is now on us, now that you've prioritized it, to tell you how we we're gonna do that for you. Um, goal two, which was providing a responsible and engaged government. Your top three here were fully staffed city departments, which I will say was a really um, heartening thing for staff to see and hear. Um, improve the city's website. We've heard multiple examples tonight. Uh, uh, we agree that is on our priority list as well. Um, and we are chipping away at it every day, little by little. Um, I will say in our defense that 
none of us are IT experts and we're, we're trying very hard, but we recognize that that is a thing that needs improvement. And then your third here was implement the equity action plan recommendations. Your, why can't I make that smaller? Your third goal was create more housing. The top three here were maintain funding for the housing trust fund, coordinate with housing partners for VHCB grant funds, or look for other housing funds for something like a service hub for those experiencing homelessness. If you remember in your last council meeting, you did approve um, funding for the homelessness task force to look into this issue, which really um, shows your commitment to this initiative. And then the third one was update the home the housing task forces barriers to housing study. The next goal is practice good environmental stewardship. Your top three here were the implementation of the net zero plan recommendations, develop a long term plan to address the discharge of toxic PFAS chemicals at our water resource recovery facility, which we talked a lot about today, promote conservation around Berlin Pond, including acquiring property. Goal five, uh, build and maintain sustainable infrastructure. Your top three here were construct a public restroom or public community restrooms. Um, however, that works out. You do have a committee that will be working on that. And I do know that quite a few other ones are looking at options here. Like quite a few committees are looking at this solution and I have no doubt that we will get to one. The second would be provide sufficient funding for infrastructure investment. Kelly just walked through a lot of those pro Project, so I won't go through them again, um, but we do have identified capital needs um, and you've prioritized investing in those. Then provide sufficient funding to attain and maintain at least 70 PCI average for road conditions. Um, I think Zach just came and spoke about that recently. And um, so that did make one of the top priorities, which really ties into that infrastructure investment. But since it is a separate project and it does require separate funding streams. We saw that as a separate initiative. And then goal six, improve public health and safety. Your top three were implementing a definitive plan for homelessness and then creating that, that housing hub that we talked about before as a regional effort with services for those experiencing homelessness and the implementation of the police review committee recommendations. So those are your top three there. So that was sort of the high level overview of the initiative ranking. Were there any um, ones that seemed out of place or needed any pushback or reconsideration? All right, thank you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real Amazing. quick. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanna observe, I, so I don't disagree with any of them. I do wanna observe that a lot of the ones that ended up in the top three were kind of the fun ones. You know, like they were ones that like people are like, you know, really psyched about or passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I want to just acknowledge that there's a lot of like things that need to happen every day that are a little bit more mundane that didn't make the top three, but are still important. And mm -hmm. um, and that's that, and that's okay. I just I just want to acknowledge that. And I think um, you know we talked about this a few times, and the things that staff. Okay, so I'll say I'm going to be sort of frank here. The things that are not council projects that were presented and put, put forward by council as a new idea that has not been something that we've been working on long term for many, many years, or it's just part of our job. We're not if they were not included in your top high scores uh, initiatives, they weren't included. But the things that staff put forward. So I'll, I have a slide up right now in front of me. Goal six, improve public health and safety. For instance, um, E911 renaming project continuation didn't make it into your list of prior, like top initiatives to prioritize in your council plan, because this is what your strategic plan is, but it is going to be in department work plans. It's not going away in, in that we are tracking our work towards that. We will be doing that work. It's just not in what you have decided as your top priorities, which helps us fund budget wise, right? These things won't be unfunded, but you're saying, to me very clearly, I want a definitive plan towards homelessness. How do we get there? And so that helps us do that extra work that needs to get done because you are telling us what's important to you, which is what is important to the community. 
Those things are, the mundane things are important. They're not going away, I promise. We will do mundane things every day. <laughs> We're grateful. We're grateful. Which is exciting. So. We love the mundane things. It's great. I <laughs> think Jay had a comment. Done. Well, what I don't want to do is open up a can of worms, but just looking at some of these things, I'm just, we all voted and this is sort of how it played out, but to your point, <laughs> Mayor, like some of the things that that rose to the top were not necessarily fun, but things that were top of mind. Sure, that's, sure. You know, that's fair. so um, like so it, and fun. Some of them. To be fair, <laughs> but so I, I don't know that we want to like if this is a, an opportunity to say like, hey, do we want to reconsider this? But I, I, you know, I, I will just put one thing out there, and then we can delve in or not. I, I'm open to the conversation, but. Looking at slide six, goal goal four, good environmental stewardship. Um, you know, I, I think about what, what the what the community impact of of acquiring property around Berlin Pond is relative to making sure that we have parks in all parts of the city in terms of what our priorities are. I know, you know, the evening that we talked about this, and soon after we, you know, we all got emails and heard from Christine, you know, saying this was timely. This is a unique opportunity that maybe now is a good time to acquire some property and, and that there's, you know, dollars associated with it. And it's a it's sort of an easy thing. But is that is is that really a when we talk about being a, a good environmental stewards, is that a top priority of ours? So I, that's just one thing that that jumped out to me. Um, you could look at other things lower on the list relative to that. But that was one th just as an example, something that I wonder how like is, is that is that piece a priority to be fair, creating parks in all parts of the city did make it into your higher scored initiatives for that one. Yeah, seventh relative yeah. to third. So again, well, that's why that, I'm, that's why that, I'm talking about <laughs> can of worms here. Like yeah, I don't right. really, like <laughs> but I, think, I think the important part there, Jay, is to understand that that means the count. That's something that we're going to be, you know, once it's in the list. Then we pay less attention to the ranking it's like what what were the top ones that made it so that means and you also have implementing the parks commission's green print which is actually calling for parks in all yeah. parts of the town so you get two things that said almost the same thing were out of the top seven so i would say you know as i read this i say that's a pretty strong statement from the council that you want to look at park expansion around the city so um, and also none of these are tying y'all to any action necessarily um what we're hearing is in this for example using the berlin pond example it's here's like staff is going to get to you here's the the path forward with that here's what it would cost and it's up for y'all to to make that decision at which point you could say no i'd rather it go to parks and all park you know there's there's options there and the other thing about that, that's a good example, because it just says promote conservation around the pond, and this is including the property. What, what this does for us, just, and I think it's helpful to have this conversation, because, you know, I, I can understand, actually, it's a great observation that you made, is now, if, say, an opportunity comes up during the year, and Christine or someone call, calls me and says, hey, is this something, I can say, yes, we want to, we're in. We've already said this is important. Now we, you know, we can't commit the money yet, but yes, we're, we'll, we'll, let's pursue this as opposed to. Well, I don't know how the council feels about this. We got to put it on the next agenda. That you've told us that if to pursue these opportunities, you haven't said we're committing money. You've just said this is important to us. You know, and and I really appreciate that. Thank you to Cameron and Bill. I just, um, um, I, I'm trying to be. <laughs> very respectful that there are so many hours in a day and so uh wanting to acknowledge that it, it obviously ultimately ultimately we have to make a decision about spending money if we were to acquire property etc but i appreciate that but i also want to make sure that you have you know a sense of yeah hey these these are um hey it, it it showed up number three so we should really spend a lot of our time trying to make it happen but more it falls into that mix of mix of like what's feasible and 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 um, what's actionable and what we can actually, you know, make happen. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, uh, Lauren and then Connor. Yeah, just one 
kind of question that keeps coming up when I read it. I mean, I think it seemed to really capture well through this process the things that have been, I think, top of mind and, you know, big priorities that I've certainly been hearing from a lot of community members about and that kind of thing. Like, just to the, you know, like, like the example of the green print and the create parks in all parts of the city, like I, the way that you wrote up this into more of the document, it seemed to do some of that kind of collapsing or, or there's like uh, funding the peer support worker, I think it shows up on three different priorities. I'm just like, I think there could be some condensing of it, which um, just some of them are either saying, seem to be saying the same thing in slightly different ways or just like a part of, like there's some are really big ideas and some are really specific mm -hmm. pieces of ideas. So just, I don't know if it's helpful to you or if you're like, no, we know what you mean. We're fine. We're good to go. Like, I mean, the rankings might have come out slightly differently depending on how you had sliced and diced things a little differently, but. That I is true. That, that I think that kind of happens in any collaborative process yeah. when we're all trying to, to get to a final document. I think that when we shift this conversation to that, that strategic plan document, that comes a little bit more clear. But there also is conversation amongst staff is when we develop our work plans to, to get to this end goal is where does that peer support worker fall in, right? Is it a public safety thing? Yes, but is it up to my office, say, instead of Chief Pete, for instance, coming up with a plan there? So um, are you saying, are you asking if you think the rankings would come out differently if we had bucketed it differently? Because I think that could probably I mean, be true for all of them. I, I think that could be the case. I'm more just <clears throat> wanting to make sure that you all have clarity given that some are pretty specific and I think really clear mm -hmm. and some are, you know, even like, you know, move forward with the police review committee recommendations, like mm -hmm. one of those is peer support, but like, and yes. then there's a whole bunch of pieces and that will be a moving target. So I, I feel very there's clear. a lot of overlap to me yeah. in a bunch of them, but as long as it works for you all, then we don't need no, to. No, I, I feel clear too. And I think you're, you know, you're right. We did go through these and try to eliminate duplicates, but you know, obviously didn't get them all. And, uh, so uh, as, long, as long as it good, works, I good just point, don't want yeah. to be giving you mushy No, means we have three, we, we need three newer, more peer support workers. That was very clear. For, for every goal we do. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Uh, no, really. But I, I think this is excellent, Cameron. And I, I really, I, I enjoyed the process too. I, I think I preferred it to when we brought the consultant in and everything. It seemed much more efficient. One thing I missed, though, like last year, it, it seemed like we had an opportunity to sit across the stable, table from department heads there mm -hmm. and get more direct feedback from them. So I was wondering if there's any takeaways as you shared these with staff that they thought like, you know, without fear of retaliation or anything, no. it's like, uh, <laughs> like, did they think we're going in the right direction on some stuff? Are they like, these guys are bigger wing nuts than we thought, like in some ways? It's, are there takeaways like that you can share? Um, so conversations with staff has been mostly positive. I, I don't, I'm, I'm really trying to, even if I was not trying, I'm not trying to throw anyone in the bus because there's no one to throw, right? Mm -hmm. Because the conversations that I've had have been really understanding of how we've done this process this year, which is a little different than we did last year. Obviously we were in person for some of it, but they also got to put their ideas on the wall mm -hmm. and y'all got to look at all of the ideas, your ideas and their ideas with sort of, um, a blank slate approach to it. And I think they feel very heard and these recommendations make sense in the context of our work plans. Good. So I haven't heard any negative feedback. No, I haven't either. And I think, you know, to that point, we did a similar process with them to prioritize theirs to bring forward. And, you know, they were invited to all the meetings. They, they, they were all public meetings. I know some folks were present when we had the workshop. I think some people zoomed in, um, but I think, and I think we were we had said hey if you see them doing something that you're really concerned about speak up and mm -hmm. we didn't put a gag order on anybody so um i think i think cameron i agree with cameron that people seem comfortable and they understand I, like i told you um you know this last meeting you know, this is the clearest sort of prioritization and direction we've got i think people really appreciate that thanks mm -hmm. so i'd love to pivot us to the draft document if that Sounds good. Okay. All right, let's see if I can share a Word document now. I don't, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. All right. 
sharing the screen. All I want is to share this. Please work. Okay. So we have a in front of you a draft of the uh, council plan as it stands now. Um, these these plans. So this one will be quite a bit longer when we include the the work plans of the staff that will get to these initiatives. Right. So what the document you're looking at now is not incomplete. It just has will have addendum to it when I'm done with the work plans with the staff that basically outlines what they will be doing to make sure that not only these initiatives are accomplished, but those sort of more mundane tasks. Right. So um, This is a full document for y'all and will be supplemented with addendum as the work plans are created. Um, I do know that uh, there was some time to look at our vision, mission, and values that came out of y'all's conversation. So I didn't know if you wanted to start um, there and see if there's any um, uh, proposed edits or wording changes, scrapping them completely to the three statements. Here. <laughs> Comments. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. I mean, I, I think that the the spirit of what's in the vision and mission statements are are right on. Um, I think that they could. Um, I think that the mission statements a little closer to the vision, and the vision's a little closer to the mission in terms of what those statements ultimately should be, and could use some wordsmithing. Um, I had hoped to. Take a look at it before tonight, but I wasn't able to. Um, so I don't know if, you know, given the spirit of what's there, you know, I'm fine with with moving on with this. But if if there was a need, if there was any value in trying to do some words with it, I don't, we're not going to do it just right here. But then I, I'd be willing to do that. But that being said, I think you've captured what we what needed to be captured. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I'd be happy to work with you. I just. I appreciated your comment just now about you know flipping the vision and mission, and um, so uh, as the person that did the initial drafting on this, what I looked at the vision is what was our vision of the city, like just the community. So we see it as a growing city. We this is what we see our city, and then the mission is what do we the city organization do? What's what's the mission of our specifically the city government versus the vision for the community? So I was trying to capture those things as slightly in that fashion but i you know if i did if it could be done differently i'm i'm all good for that and and that was basically a summary of what we you all had thrown out um at least yeah but I'm, better wording is always welcome you know one possibility is that uh if you uh come up with some edits that have for another time we could always revisit it because the spirit of, of you know the ideas are there i just man, i've done this over the years and my work has been a little bit different in how the ideas were, were conveyed that's all all right so we'll scroll past that we can come back to that it does not uh i mean the ethos is great it does not necessarily impact the plan in um anyway so we're going to move on um so the first part of the um strategic plan explains how we ended up here what the planning process was how we changed it to align with the city's budget development cycle to ensure priorities could receive weighted consideration for inclusion um we also uh, really made it very clear as to um what sort of the 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 situation that we're facing um, this year is. So I did reference the COVID-19 pandemic, the ARPA funding, and um, some general considerations we needed to take in mind as we built out this strategic plan. Um, I was, uh, I did have a very uh, good point, and I think I would like to edit this sort of live with y'all, is that these goals that you uh, outlined are not in any sort of specific order. Um, so I would like to change them to like bullet pointed instead of numbered because I don't want there to be an implied order of those. They're just the order in which we've discussed them. So that was some feedback I had received. So I'm going to do that. 
Um, this basically summarizes uh, the goals and the prioritized strategies. Again, that is not saying those are the only strategies. They're the ones that y'all have prioritized for us as staff to implement. Please interrupt at any point. I'm just going to keep scrolling through these. If something didn't reach a level that was higher than the average, then it didn't make this particular no if it's so these are just strategies oh, so then strategies. so okay, then sorry. we go down yeah. and we break up each of the goal strategies into initiatives oh, okay thank you thank you yes okay. so your I, again i'm going to change these before so that it just says um strategic plan goal improve community prosperity i'm just gonna while we're here yellow. take out the number huh strategic plan goal yellow <laughs> yes, the yellow goal. <laughs> so our community prosperity, it sort of explains what we're talking about there. Um, again, based on y'all's feedback, it talked about the economic pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and aims to be adaptive and responsive to recovery efforts there. Um, so then it sort of goes into explaining those strategies that y'all voted on and prioritized and then those initiatives that back that up. So this is where it sort of addresses what Lauren was saying about bucketing these things. And so all of these initiatives will be included in some sort of work plan for a department that it best aligns with. So this is sort of what we just went through in a different format. And I changed the format a little bit this year to align closer with Invisio because you were getting printed Invisio, you were getting Invisio reports every quarterly. And this is the, the structure that it comes in and I didn't want it to be one way and then you get a report on another. So um, this is how the strategies and initiatives will be um, in the Invisio programming. Um, let's take that number right on out. Um, so that it basically goes through in the same way uh, with a little bit more care taken in the wording um, and less spaghetti on the wall and more of like, this is actually what you want to do. Um, so the initiatives there, um, improving coordin Im I'm sorry, the strategy for providing responsible engaged government was communicate effectively. For instance, you had the website, intergenerational community events, coordination with capital area neighborhood. Uh, for instance, we're working very hard on the RFP right now and looking for um, responses within the next week. So get excited for that. So there's a lot of things that we're doing here that take place sort of cross departmental um, uh, uh, initiatives that are cross-departmental that we will put into plans and explain how we will get there. Um, some sort of live editing here, getting rid of some numbers. I'm just going to continue to scroll through these. So I hadn't heard any feedback on formatting. I'm hoping as we are going through these that these feel um, easily understandable and approachable for folks. Um, I try to keep the writing level on these um, uh, approachable and accessible as much as possible. Um, if you've caught any jargon, please let me know. I'm trying very hard to stay away from that. And also using colloquialisms. My quaint Southern accent does not tra <laughs> translate very well into formal documents. So I'm just continuing to work through to scroll through these. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, ma'am. Um, don't have to do it right now, but just wherever there is a uh, abbreviation, like CVPSA or yes. CJC or CIT. See, this is very this. helpful. I forget immediately that you know these I mean? things like, are real. I yes. think all of those, so to be fair, as long as it's somewhere in this document, <laughs> what those things are, okay. mm -hmm. and then like, oh yeah, we're gonna be using the CJC abbreviation. I, I just wanna make sure that that is- uh, Thank you, that's very spelled helpful. Spelled out somewhere, but again, it doesn't have to be right now. <laughs> so that might take a while, so. Yeah, right, because there's a, Don't there's try a lot. To do that right now. I will not, I'm just trying yeah. to make notes for myself to make sure to go back through and take those out. Yeah, like, you know, PCI was in there, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody, Coming in cold may not know what PCI is. Thank you. Somebody yeah. coming in cold like me. Thank you. Yeah. Condition index. <laughs> or, or, the, or members of the uh, of the public. Exactly. One thing, one thing that occurred to me following up on what the mayor <clears> just <throat> said was that uh, there are references in this to a lot of other documents. 
and it would be cool since this is going to be on the web page to link to those things so that where you say we're going to uh, update the barriers to housing study link to the study we did years ago or the equity plan or the police review uh, report or all of those things so that people can know what we're talking about or what we have exactly. talked about. I will do that. Thank you. That'd be amazing. And so um, this last graph um, or chart that I included um, comes from the team. So when I said uh, there were going to be some other additional strategies um, to accomplish your goals, these are the ones that the team has um, prioritized internally in addition to your initiatives. Um, so for instance, improving community prosperity, some additional strategies will be communicating effectively regarding our, bud our budget, um, developing finance policies and procedures, continuing that technological assessment and infrastructure planning that Kelly just overviewed with y'all, um, grants management, our FEAST program, we're trying very hard to um, grow that and we're very excited to um, talk to y'all about what that means um, throughout the year as we work on that. Um, there's some other ones that impact, like the senior center is looking to achieve accreditation. Our permitting process, we want to make sure that's more equitable and improved. Some of these include um, things like language access improvements. We want to make sure that that's improved citywide. And a lot of these tie directly into the goals that y'all have. So um, I've outlined some of those. Um, one that I always think is very interesting and I enjoy very much is our cemetery green practices. We have a really state-of-the-art cemetery um, and I, I wanted to shout that out. Um, when we're mm -hmm. talking about in good environmental stewardship, they are a leader in our state. Um, we have other things like our the implementing the home energy ordinance. It's very important and something our departments need to work on. Um, another one I think is very important to call out is our long-term plan, the city plan, which ultimately is the city's guiding strategic document um, that hopefully at the end of that process, this document will feed from and to. So um, that's very exciting and important. And I know planning and the planning commission has been putting a lot of work into that. Another one that's come up in conversation recently that some of y'all might be interested in is the snow melt initiative using district heat trying to bring on a new district heat user um, and that, that would be solely for melting snow um, in the back there so that we're not we have a, a sustainable way to melt the snow and then add more so we're not just creating a backlog there so um, we also truly need to create a more sustainable district heat management and expansion plan we don't currently have that um, uh, we have folks who work very dedicatedly on district heat but we could use a plan with y'all's buy-in. So that's one of the things that's important for us. Some things in our public health and safety that I wanted to call out um, was that E911 renaming project that's continuing. We're really working towards improvement, improving our national flood insurance program community rating system. Um, we'd like to pitch some building code updates to y'all and um, really making sure that the CJC the Community Justice Center is fully supported. And so that's something that they wanna do. They do wanna expand some of their programs. Um, and then let's see what else. We've got, um, and then the community resource officer position is new within our MPD and they really do want to expand that. And that's a big goal for them is implementing that further within our community. So um, I, I skipped in and cho chose some of those but that's what our staff um, really came up with as additional strategies to implement your goals in addition to the priorities that you all have identified. So um, that's where we're at with a strategic plan. Um, I'd love uh, for, um, if you are comfortable with it, I would like this, I, I feel like this is ready for adoption so that we can move forward with our work plans with the um, caveats that I will get rid of jargon, and I will <laughs> <laughs> link to those studies and documents, which was a great idea. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Connor, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, two things. We, we spent a lot of time talking about how COVID would be incorporated into this document. Mm -hmm. and I think you guys did a great job on that. I, I think it you know, comes through loud and clear in, in a lot of these bullets uh, without being a standalone one. So I just want to say thanks so much because we, we spent a lot of time on that. Um, I don't know if it belongs in this document, but one thing, obviously, it's going to be on my mind, the responsible contractor ordinance uh, that we put a lot of work into a couple of years ago. I think, like, I assume it's going to be triggered for the first time over the next calendar year here with some of the bigger ticket items there. So maybe a reference to, you know, this would be the first time that we would we would use that. And also, like, you know, pat ourselves on the back. It's going to create safer workplaces and offer a prevailing wage and good jobs for folks. Are you suggesting that be called out any particular place or just, I, I, I'm, you know, just scrolling through like, sure. you know, it could go somewhere. Throw it in there somewhere. Yeah. I think it could go. <laughs> my my initial response to that would be putting it in this this larger goal narrative talking about, you know, this we're looking forward to implementing this in some of our larger contracts. So I'll make a note language that's a, right that's an implement yeah, something no, that, you've already done like right yeah. Yeah. Language referencing other thoughts or comments this is a lovely document thank you thank you i appreciate the plain language <laughs> yeah i feel very comfortable with this um I'm very grateful for all the work you put into it and helping uh, to organize our thinking uh, around this. There's a lot of work embodied by this document. And I just want to recognize that uh, we have, well, so normally we do this process at the beginning of a term, right? Like in roughly early April or so. And, and here we are uh, in. Uh, late October, uh, recognizing that we have uh, an election coming up uh, in March. I don't really expect all of us to get done by March. No. Um, and just want to make sure that we are <laughs> clear about that. Um, so one question, do you anticipate uh, doing this again next uh, fall, roughly, or in April? I would recommend and my uh, recommendation for y'all to consider would be to review this in April to see if it still makes sense if you see if there's any changes or direction change that would really like to happen. But otherwise, this is really setting those budget priorities that will carry us through the next fiscal, like this fiscal year. Oh, well, I'm sorry, the 2023 fiscal year as we're creating that document, which is why we moved it. Um, and I think to be frank, I think that's the right choice. I think that really gives us clarity that we didn't have before. And I think it also gives people time and gives the council time in the spring to see how it's going, to get a report on where we are with as much as we can do right now and to check in and see if it makes sense to the council that's sitting on the dais at that time. Great. Jack. With that said, I move that we adopt this as the uh, Thank you. City Council strategic plan uh, with the uh, formatting and other editorial changes that the uh, staff is going to be uh, inserting. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? And I, I would like to check to make sure, because I'm my laptop has also died. <laughs> sadly. Um, so I cannot see if there's a hand. I will check. Hold on. Let me stop sharing. I think we might just, oh, okay. there's one person who is not media and or staff. And okay. I don't know her. She's uh, not all right. Uh, so any further comment, public or council? Okay, <clears throat> um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. This has been you, a Cameron. really great process and I just really appreciate the time and effort that y'all have put into this. It's made my job a lot easier and I'm really excited to um, share the work plans with you when they're done. I'll probably just send those out. So thank you very much. Yeah. Good well, thank job you. you and the rest of the team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What does it mean when you say bless their hearts and Tanya? Oh. This council? That's, a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that, that's not normally yeah. very nice. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank
thankfully we don't have two uh, intellectually deep uh, items left. Right. So um, winter schedule, Bill, do you want to talk about that? Uh, this is really not that much different than what we normally do. Um, typically what we've run into starting about now is uh, we always seem to run into the, our, our third, our fourth, our, <laughs> our second meeting in November, which was the fourth week, thank you, always falls the, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And typically councils haven't wanted to meet then. I don't know why. Um, so we've, uh, we've moved that up one week to the 17th. That's pretty normal procedure, but still it's something you need to you know, vote to do. Uh, and then we have run into that in the past with Christmas. Sometimes it bumps up, but this year it actually is the 22nd and you know the, the Christmas doesn't really start to the 24th and 5th and the school vacations and all. So I put the 22nd as still being a, a meeting if people want to change that, but th that actually gives us a chance to have a budget workshop in between and get kind of ahead of the game budget time uh, on December 15. And then I threw in the, the January 5 budget workshop if we need it. You can always cancel them. Um, and then, in, then the other funky thing is that we have, because town meeting falls on March 1st this year, and we have to have everything warned 40 days in advance, that pushes us up to January 20 is the deadline for any, for, for ballot items. And that's always a Thursday night, just because of the way the 40 days runs. We could meet Wednesday the 19th, that would be fine. It just means that if petitions come in on the 20th, we'd have to then meet again to accept them and put them on the ballot. Now, maybe there won't be petitions this year, who knows, but um, so typically we've just done it all on the Thursday night, so we have everything done. It's our one Thursday night meeting of the year. So again, there's nothing unusual here. It's just each year we put it on the agenda and each year you vote have your chance to weigh in if you don't want to do these dates. Uh, <laughs> Lauren, thumbs up. Um, Jack, go ahead. One of these nights is my wife's birthday, but still, I think it's a sensible. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I move we adopt the schedule as proposed. Oh, that was a motion. Yes. Okay, there's a motion and a second. <clears throat> Further discussion. Okay, uh, and Cameron, anybody online? Nobody. Uh, other hand raised. Okay, uh, so and, and, any further thoughts? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Great. Gives us some certainty around that. That's nice. Uh, all right, and then filling some vacancies from Councillor Richardson. Uh, now, to be fair. I we this could be an opportunity to like reshuffle everything, but in the interest of time, I think we should just focus on <laughs> the ones that where there is a vacancy. Uh, so focusing on just those pieces, uh, let's just jump jump into it. I'm I'm just gonna take them one at a time, if that's okay, team. Um, so looking at uh, the building. Code Appeals Committee that rarely meets. That's a thing, right? Right. It does rarely meet. That's right. What's that? We've had maybe three meetings in the last year. Oh, they're usually like 15 minute meetings. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and we need, there's like a minimum number of people that we need on that? There's been two council members and a community member. And I don't think we've re up the community member. I mean, at some point we might want to, not, nothing against the individual, but just we might want to consider whether to put that out again. But we've typically had two council members and it's this is in case someone appeals a decision of the, the building inspector, oh. you know, on a code. This is a weird. Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yeah, sure. Super, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't quite sure what the community advisory board was. It just says vacant. I wonder if that was like supposed to be the the citizen advisory board or the CJC. Yes. Oh yes, yeah, that is the cab. That is the cab. Okay, so I'm gonna we'll we'll get to that. I'm gonna cross that one out for now. 
Um, the capital improvement uh, plan committee. I can go back to that one. I'm, I was on in 20 and somehow got shifted off. So okay. I don't know, and Lauren, but I'm happy to. Lauren. Okay. I'm kind of interested, but I also don't need to be on it and could come to a meeting if I can get inspired. I don't have it in front of me. Who is on it presently? Uh, capital plan improvement committee says Mayor Watson, Councilor Bate, Councilor Richardson, obviously it's a vacancy. Councilor Erickson. Erickson. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, in the, is that okay with you? Okay, great. So, thank you, Jay. Um, uh, CVPSA. Now, we talked about that kind of last time. What? Right. We appoint someone, we appoint two people, actually. And then three, we have, there's three elected positions, and Barry Montpelier each appoint two. And Donna is now one of the elected positions, but she's not a council appointee. So I think Doug Hoyt to... might be one of our appointees. I think that's and true. And I think Dan Richardson was not. And uh, is anyone interested in being the other appointee? What is this? <laughs> what is the CVP? Oh, so Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Oh, how would you? <laughs> well, <laughs> so you it's it is that? the it's this the agency that's overseeing this whole communications, oh, okay. the the dispatching and and you know the idea of looking at regionalizing public safety. Got you, got you. Okay. So we could always appoint someone who's not a council. Correct. Let's do that as well. If no one is interested. And that came up at our last meeting. We actually yeah. advertising for that. Yeah. So I, I would feel okay about. Leaving that for now. And well, we should advertise it. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, we should do that. Because uh, there, things are happening, and yeah. it's it's going to take a lot of effort, but I also think that uh, there's value to having people who are doing the work, being yeah. like maybe having a police chief or a fire chief or somebody be. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, Here's the CDC. Yeah. Yeah. So the. I think it's just on there twice, and I. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. No worries. Um. So the that's this is the uh, community justice center, uh, and so they have a citizen advisory board that helps us them plan direction and uh, yeah, just advises them in general. Anyone interested in that? Actually, I. I you would be? Yeah, I would. Great. Awesome. That's, I think they only meet four times a year. We're changing that. Oh, you are? Yeah. Oh, okay. Slightly now more. it's 20. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was 52. <laughs> 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 uh, I think we're changing it to four to six times a year. Oh, okay. And then we get hit up to volunteer for all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and panels and yeah uh okay and the uh, last one is the tw wood board uh it's the art gallery that is provided to us uh art in here and yeah, yeah. So the former member of that board myself it's a great board they do meet monthly though. <laughs> Anyone? I don't think that also that also does not have to be a council member. Um, so it used to be the mayor. It was designated. It's, right. It's the mayor or the mayor's designee. Right. So um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think it's okay to put that out to the world. Someone we asked the, the arts commission or somebody from the. Oh, interesting. Someone from the public arts commission. Yeah. yeah. Potentially. That's. That would be very good. That would be very Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we can reach out potentially to the Public Arts Commission, see if there's somebody from there who would be interested. Uh, and other, otherwise, I think if we advertise that, that would be great. And does the City Hall Art Committee do anything anymore? No. <laughs> it basically is, they just, they come and set stuff up. No, but we have a committee here with three. I know, but that's never. As far as I understand it, that's never met the last two years, not <clears throat> ten years. Okay, then let's why don't we just get rid of that? I think that's fair. Totally fair. 
I feel like we should have a vote to do that. And yeah. To, uh, is there a vote to sort of officially disband the uh, city hall art committee? Yes, Jack. I would prefer to undertake this decision with a little more thought. That's fair. That's fair. That's a good call. I will say that it was somewhat of a moot responsibility during the pandemic when the <laughs> building was closed. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. That's, that's a good point. As eager as I was to join the committee, and, and there was not a whole lot to, to get done. So it's certainly something that could be revisited. Yeah. I should think this was a mayor's initiative to it kind was, of think about uh, how to redo all the art in the building, and we did get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was, uh, there was some changes happen. Changes happen. Very grateful. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, we're, I, I do think if we, I, I agree that it might make sense to disband it, but maybe at another time. So we've got uh, Morton on the building code of appeals, Erickson on the capital improvement committee, advertised for CVPSA, Morton on the CJC cab, and to be determined on the TW Wood board and talk more on city hall art. Okay. Is that right? Yep. And, and I'd say we don't, we're fine not replacing that position right. on, on the the city hall art. Yeah. 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 Fair. Okay. We just not disband it, just never replace it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Get rid of it by attrition. <laughs> One hypothesis is that we need to turn all of those names into a vote. Yeah. Might, I think it's a good call. Is there a motion to appoint folks as mentioned? Second. Okay, motion to second. Any further discussion? Uh, oh, <laughs> yes. we, we, one thing, uh, we do have the public restroom committee that Dan was oh, on, yeah. along with yeah. me. We haven't met yet. I think we're like looking at some legislative strategies for this, but uh might just be worth listening there since dan was a member of that right yep fair um anyone interested in that oh if, lauren yes if it's legislative <laughs> come on <laughs> okay okay so lauren you're up for that okay oh sorry that out there how many folks do we have on the homelessness task force? Just There's room for so another problem. You, you can absolutely okay. jump on that. So, just so you know, when this is done at the beginning after the election, you all never make it a motion when you appoint. Oh, things. really? You never oh, yeah. do? Yeah, you just do it. Oh, okay. You know, just to be. Yep, yeah, that's why I stopped keeping track of them. <laughs> I used to put every single one on the minutes. I'm like, well, they're not moving it anymore. <laughs> Okay, then. That's amazing. Okay. I think the motion has been made. I think it's a good idea to make motions about this. And to be fair, it includes the ones that we just talked about. Is that accurate? So, that's our homelessness task force. Yeah, homelessness task force. Stacking the committee. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the restroom committee. Yeah. Okay. All right, so including up both of those. Uh, all right, any further discussion? I just wondered about it. <laughs> Fair. Uh, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, knowing this. Uh, all right. So we're, that is the end of our regular business, which is amazing. Um, council reports. I'm sorry with you, Connor, because Della's not here. Is that okay? Yeah, no. Yeah. Um... No, I think the only thing uh, you, you probably noticed in the news, we've got a protest going on on the State House steps with uh, a gentleman named Josh Lissenby and Brenda Siegel. And I think he's done a good job drawing some uh, awareness to the issues we've been looking at on the ground. Um, one notable one, I was with them uh, the first night there. Uh, I didn't say overnight, uh, but I, I was seeing what they needed. They said, uh, yeah, where's the where's the public restroom that we can use after the State House closes, right? Oh, no. It was like, uh, oh, well, you know, I could drive you to the police station, I guess. So they had to do that, you know. So it's uh, it's very real. And, you know, Brenda started highlighting that in press conferences, which maybe will help with our state advocacy on this issue. So that's it for me, though. Yeah. Okay. One quick thing on a, a bit of a lighter note. Um, as, as I imagine most folks know, a lot of the uh, local um, breweries, distilleries have moved 
um, away from a from a tipping system with their servers and bartenders and pay them a, a living wage and and um, have um, then been able to donate the the tips they get throughout a month to nonprofits. Bar Hill does it in town. Um, you know. Uh, Hill Farm set up in Greensboro, The Alchemist in Stowe, um, and Lawson's down in Waitsfield has done it um, to all to great success for for local nonprofits and and um, happy to share that um, in the month of November Lawson's is going to be um, donating all of their tips to the Vermont River River Conservancy specifically when they do it they do it for projects for nonprofits not just open-ended funds and specifically for the confluence river park um, in in montpelier so if you needed an excuse to head down if you haven't been before it's a great it's beautiful but um encourage everybody to to get out and support that and that's money that will you know support at the end of the day support our community so that's it thanks thank you uh, i have no updates thank you I may be stealing uh, a point from the clerk, but I just want to mention people may have uh, seen that uh, the Vermont the reapportionment uh, committee has been at work and released a report that uh, this is the body that uh, <clears throat> has been proposing re legislative reapportionment in the state and and they decided this year to uh, eliminate multi-member house districts and go to all single member districts and so that that would uh, among other things uh, split montpelier in half uh, we've had um, a two-member district for uh, for many decades and and the proposal is to split montpelier into two districts um, the uh, the next step in the process is for the board of civil authority to meet uh, consider the proposal and make whatever comments we want to make and that meeting is going to be on november 9th and of course like everything else it's open to the public and so if people have an interest in in being heard on that this would be the opportunity to do it and i think it's going to be in this room so the uh, in-person and uh, remote uh, participation should be pretty easy. Yep. Thank you. I will pass tonight. Um, <clears throat> I just want to highlight that November uh, 18th at 4 p.m., uh, there's going to be a rededication of the uh, Challenger Explosion Monument uh, that used to be at the bottom of the hill of where you turn up to go to National Life. And uh, it's mo been moved to the grounds at uh, the high school, uh, which I think is very appropriate. It's gonna be much more accessible to folks. Um, I think a lot of folks didn't know that it was even there uh, when it was at the bottom of the hill, uh, National Life there. And it'll be so yeah it'll be much more visible um i think it was it was an important event to um school children at the time and uh and so to have it on a school campus i think um is really appropriate anyway so we're gonna have a, a time to re rededicate that uh coming up in a couple thursdays so uh just a just heads up uh okay okay uh i think that is it so uh, without objection, we will consider the meeting adjourned.